engineer.org podcast. Wait, hang on. What are we on? 26. 26. No, no, no. Wow, that was Tinny. Yeah, that was Tinny. And it cut out. Tinny. Yeah, and it cut out. Like So it sounded like it was, you know. All right, hang on. Hang on. I'm, 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 I'm going to get the... Hang on. Number 26. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. Great. Now we, that? Blew all the, we blew all the hearing aids out of our geriatric, geriatric listeners. Yeah, I had to switch it up though. I mean, the, the, you know, you guys were complaining last time that it wasn't wasn't oomph enough, so I wanted to, to throw some anger into it. Well, that's true. I'm I mean, you know, at DEF CON, you were pretty weak. You know, everyone, even the whole crowd said it that it was pretty weak. So, no, nah, I don't. I don't think that's that's, a, that's what happened. But we'll, we'll just go with that. Yeah, we'll go with that. So, uh, what's going on this month, this, guys? How's everybody been really since DEF CON? This is the first podcast since DEF CON. This is the first pod. I know it feels like it's been two months, but it's really only God. been like three, three weeks. Dude, time 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 speeds past after DefCon. Yes, yeah, yeah DefCon. Everything kind of slows down, and then and then afterwards, it's like the recovery time, and you 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 lose time. You forget that you have to work like twenty three hours a day to catch up from the thirteen days in Vegas. I well, the good news is is uh. It should speed up again for DerbyCon, huh? Huh? And then, and then slow down again. Yeah. It, when is that? <clears throat> really, you don't know. Well, I mean, I like everybody. I think everybody in the industry knows, except for I was for asking you. to lead in so you can like promo it. You know, I was thinking. I mean, I gave you the. I mean, Jim. Jim, slide. you know, right? Next Tuesday. <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually not not accurate. So, you know, you guys. You know, I start this venture with, with a couple of buddies, and it turns into this big thing, and you guys don't support me at all. You know what? <laughs> Next Tuesday. <laughs> that was an epic answer because he said it so seriously. <laughs> Gotta love Jim. <laughs> uh, it's not Tuesday, uh, fool. It's Thursday. Oh. September 30th yeah. to October 2nd. Oh, of 2013? Yes. Yeah, yeah we it's hold so- it every five years. Every why time. did you pick those? Why did you pick that date? What, what's the significance of that date range? Of September 30th, October 2nd. Yeah. yeah. What's the significance? We're, we're, of that ne- date we're next Tuesday. No, the 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 real date, not not when I'm going to see you next. Oh, oh. Um, no, it, for us, we just looked at uh, what conferences were where, and uh, when we wanted to, to to start ours, and it was really the only time in the month that gave enough space between like DefCon and ShmooCon and things like that that uh, we didn't want to really compete. Um, you know, with, with that type of thing. So for us, it it made sense. And plus, in Louisville, um, the September time frame is just like perfect weather the entire time. It's like, you know, 65 degrees and sunny. Um, huh. So, you know, we we decided to to use that as a month uh, based on the weather and 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 where the schedule of the cons were at to, to kind of go from there. So, yeah, that, that's you know, that, that's kind of unexpected. That's not what I had heard. What did you hear? It had to do with the fall equinox and some sacrifices that you were going to be making or something. But that 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 wasn't supposed to come out publicly. <laughs> okay, well we'll just edit that part out. For the yeah, podcast. yes, edit that out. So Jim, should we tell him that we're launching the uh, Social Engineer Con on October first and second in Tennessee? <laughs> 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 I, I kind of thought that that the the whole the whole derby con was actually going to come out to be an attack vector instead. <laughs> was going to come out during what? It, it was just going to come out vector it was, instead. Yeah, it's it's like going to be menu option twelve, and that it just. Oh it, yeah, you just tele- teleported you there. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I'll start going then now. <laughs> Get Python to do some work, brother. 
I know, jeez. But we are we are working on uh, version 2.1 to be released at uh, DerbyCon. That would be exciting. I mean, it's been like, what, six hours since you had a release, so you're behind the schedule here. Dude, if you had any idea how much code I've knocked out in the past two weeks alone, it's... Because your mama told you to? Because your mama told you to. Dude, why, did, why did you have to call my mom? Because he said you knocked it out, get it? You know, mama said, you know... Wow, oh, you're an old LL Cool J reference from, like, 19... Yeah, I know, I'm, I'm supposed to recognize that you're making a 1980s joke. Yeah, really. You know? I mean, like... That, we all grew up is, in the all right, so recognize that was bad, Jim. So we have we have our new poll. Did you recognize Elwood's nineteen eighties joke? <laughs> <laughs> we should do something like that because that is that was ridiculous. <laughs> that was like who's got the worst jokes on the podcast? You're like you know, and that was uh, terrible. Elwood would win. Oh, dude, I yeah. could win that one. I could actually win one. <laughs> You're a pathetic. Okay, so set. 2.1. Give us at least the, uh, like, what's the, what's the big, what's going to be the big new stuff? And set All right, I'll, 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 I'll give you an exclusive, because I haven't talked to anybody about this except for uh, the set developers, which is uh, Brian and Joey. And um, we've been working on, uh, basically, set the, the, the initial set menu is going to be completely redesigned um, so that you have it broken down into social engineering attacks and penetration testing attacks, i.e., uh, we've decided to integrate um, Fast Track fully into the Social Engineer Toolkit, and um, essentially we have been rewriting each and every attack vector from the, the ground up uh, to make it better. Um, for example, if you look at um, the old Fast Track, uh, Fast Track used uh, Nmap for for basically leveraging uh, ports and things like that. So that was another third-party dependency that you had. Uh, instead, we wrote our own multi-threaded. Uh, port scanner that goes through and does identification of it. We're also incorporating uh, Scapy now uh, for uh, packet forging for uh, protocol uh, support as well as a lot of other things uh, that should really take set to the next level. So um, the social engineering toolkit will now include um, different attack vectors um, from Fast Track. Now it won't it won't have all of them in originally. Like I said, we're completely um, rewriting it from scratch. So that takes a lot of time. Uh, Fast Track, you know, was a was a couple year project. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely going to be stronger in the long run with a lot of new attack vectors and a lot more improvements on it. That's pretty awesome, man. That is really awesome. Do, Who hey, will you would do, uh, do me a favor, Dave. Um, make one of the attack vectors be named Gut Punch. Gut what? It, gut could you do punch. that? Gut Punch. Gut Wrench? Punch. Gut Punch. Gut Punch. Okay. Yeah. We, can, we can make one Gut Punch. That, that that'd be good. Would it, would it, would it punch you in the gut? That's like this isn't, this isn't this isn't another '80s joke, is it? I don't know. It probably no, is. No, but I don't just... even know what this one is. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a this is a Dr. Dre 1974 joke. No, I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking more. It would be funny to, to have to write a report that says we use the gut punch attack vector to compromise 17 hosts. <laughs> Okay, okay. See, I see where you're going with that. Now, see, you have to explain me. You, you have, you're like one of those smart people that does like complicated things that that you know you yeah. take one word and it you know piggybacks like six months worth of thought. Right. So, you know, right. It's hard yeah, for, I us, agree it's hard for us pity folk to understand that. Yeah. I agree with that, Jim. Jim, you got to sometimes set your jokes up because none of us really understand where you're coming from. Like what I think would be funny is if you name one of the attacks like herpes, and it's like I ran. Yeah, it's just, that's funny. Everybody just laughs because you said you said the name herpes. Right, you, right. So that's funny, and say, everyone gets it. But when you say gut punch, it's like we don't know if that's another reference to some, like, deep blue, south blues band that no one ever heard of that has, like, one listener, and that's you, because that's what yeah, we're going to and, and we kind of want to laugh initially because we don't know if the other person gets it. So we don't want to, like, look <laughs> stupid and, like, the other person doesn't get it. So then, if, then you can kind of tell if I'm, like, if I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, and then you realize, yeah. like, what does that even mean? That I just laughed yeah, and then, and then I realized you didn't know it, so then I said something. Yeah. See, I, I, I do think, back, though, like, that naming it herpes would be good, too, because then you could say herpes is a menu option in set, brother. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, <laughs> the, 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 I know. Please. Okay. We're quickly moving on. So DEFCON, DEFCON recovery, great. Um, got some – you know, I just got I got to say it again because, you know, we kind of – we didn't get our, our – sponsors on at defcon but uh the event with the with the um both the kids ctf and the social engineering ctf 
uh, really went off awesome, and it wouldn't have went as good if it wasn't for all the people that supported us. Like uh, we had Core Impact, and those guys were—we didn't even get to meet up with them there, but they were so busy with their stuff. But um, but their support was essential. Qualis, which actually came, I think one of the Qualis guys had his kid inside in the in the DefCon uh, kid CTF, so that was cool, and uh, they were a big supporter. And uh, Qualis, they're really cool guys too. I mean, afterwards, just talking with them and everything, they really are are pretty cool guys over there. Uh, All Clear ID, which is another one that did their, uh, they do um, um, identity protection for for kids. I, I mean, I, I started looking into this. You know, like the majority of social security numbers that are stolen are are kids' social security numbers, because you know they can't. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, they can't. Well, they can't check their credit reports. They can't check that stuff. So people start stealing like newborns' uh, IDs. And by the time they're they're like 18, they have crappy credit because they had like 85 credit cards and 30 loans, and they had no clue. Well, that's, I, I actually pay for. I know. I know this is going to sound really stupid, and and people would will probably ridicule me for it. And I'm fine with that. But I do have LifeLock for me, my wife, and my my kid. And people will say, you know, well, that's the stupidest thing ever. Well, yeah, someone can still steal your identity, but at the same time, I get. I get credit reports delivered to me all the time. I have activity monitoring that, that happens all the time. And then in order for anybody to take a loan on any of my kids or myself's name, they actually have to call me and answer like six questions that are personal to me. So regardless of with that type of hack that you give that, you know, that service, I mean, for me, it's been really beneficial. I, I don't think, I mean, I don't think people would normally heckle you. I mean, I, I think the attitude that people heckle sometimes with that is if, and, and I know you, um, but some people will like rely too heavily on like, yeah. they have that, and they think like that's the end all. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, you know, and, and, and for me, I, I realize that I'm, you know, nothing's impervious to, to attack, but at the same time, I'm taking proactive measures to at least identify if it were to happen. And, and the biggest thing for me was, if, if it does happen, they pay up to a million dollars to fix your credit. So as long as, right. you know, they didn't take, you know, over a million, I'm okay, and, you know, hopefully it doesn't happen. Yeah, uh, you know, and I think that for kids, uh, that's not really a dumb idea, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Especially with what you just said. In fact, I, you know, I just added a kid because it was actually like three bucks a month or something. Um, you know, so I, I didn't even know that the kids were at the highest risk to, to get their identity stolen. Yeah, and that's what this company does. Is they, it's basically like LifeLock for your kid's identity. They, you, you register your kid with this thing, and then they all um, they, they monitor the, your kid's credit and other identity-related items and see if anyone's using it for anything that it shouldn't be used for and then report back to you. So it, it, gotcha. it's a, it, yeah, it's an interesting service, and you know, not knowing that, and then looking into it and seeing, I was reading some stories online of these kids who, you know, are 16, 17 now. They go to apply for a loan to get their first car, and they find out that you know they've been bankrupt twice. And it's hey. like, what, <laughs> you know, and 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 it, this is like real life stories happening. You know, these kids are finding out that they've identities have been stolen and never knew about it. Like, never were notified or knew because they're kids. So who checks their credit report? And then all of a sudden they, you know, they go to get their first car and they find out that they have years of hassle in their life because of having their identity stolen. Ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Got to protect our kids. Yep, I'm with you. So all of your ID... um, Another one that really uh, we all, we keep talking about, EFF, ridiculous. Those guys are... Uh, are just amazing. Awesome. I mean, uh, we, they, we couldn't have done anything without those without the EFF. Those those people need support. Everyone should be clicking on their website, finding out how they can support them, donate, whatever. Uh, without them, I don't. There are a lot of people in this industry that are doing security research and other things like us that are getting supported by them, getting saved by them. So we love those people. And, I got a question uh, for you on that, uh, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, last year um, the the first CTF. Um, there, you know, it was the majority of the, the news articles that came out were very, very positive in nature. However, you had the scaremongering ones that were like, you know, trying to bring fear and certainty and everything. And, and um, you know, the ones that were saying, you know, hackers are, you know, dealing sensitive information. I know there was one this year, but would you say that it was, it was much more, much more received um, this year around than it was last year? I think that I think it was better received. I mean, we didn't have the FSISAC calling us, you know, like murderers and and and. Um, kidnappers and things like that so i think that was a big change you know that they they saw that last year we lived up to our word you know we didn't release information we didn't we didn't uh, embarrass companies you know we didn't hack anybody uh this year we had the one article and it was 
really misconstrued. Like even the reporter, I know the reporter that released it, and the way the article was written wasn't as bad as the title. And then the title, of course, grew as it went over the wire, and different places grabbed it, you know, from... Um, Oracle gets wiped. Uh, Oracle was hacked by DEF CON hackers, you know, and, and yeah. which is a ridiculous in its sense because if you even read the article, um, yeah, there was no hacking involved whatsoever. So it it was um, yeah, interesting to see some of the feedback on that. And then the other report. Did you contact? Did you contact that reporter? Yeah, yeah, we contacted him. He retracted a couple of his statements as a as a, a really nice guy. Really helped us out there. And, okay. and, you know, the, the problem is with wires, um, wire stories. Yeah, once, is that, once they grab yeah, it, it's, it's published, yeah. It's over there. So um, even though he, re, you know, he redid it so that made Oracle happy and, and everybody else happy, um, you, you know, that they weren't being embarrassed. And then we made a public statement. You know, we put it on the blog post saying that that's not our intent and that when we were asked in the major press conference um, what company did the worst, we refused to answer that question. Uh, because yeah. that's not what we're about. You know, we don't sit there and say, oh, here's what company fell for what vector. That's not what we do. Yeah. So, and, and, and as opposed to last year, where everybody was kind of scared afterward, we had two or three companies come up to us offering to be premier targets for next year. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah, so I'm not sure if it's going to actually happen, but, you know, if it yeah. does, even you know, and we're telling everyone now because, like, the big news, uh, I didn't get done with the sponsors yet, but the big news is we already got invited back for – for DEF CON 20. Um, yes, that's awesome. I know. Right after DEF CON, I was kind of shocked that it happened so fast. We got a call, and we're told, yep, you're invited back for the kids thing and for the uh, for the normal social engineering CTF. So we're, we're already invited that's back. It was like, yeah, so we're, we're already planning. So we're telling people, you want to be, you want to work with us as a premier company for getting called, contact us. You know, you want to you wanna work with us as a sponsor, contact us. These things are going to, probably go a lot quicker than they did last year. So we're, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's going to be – and I think with the sponsors we had this year, it kind of got some mainstream event. Um, you know, it looked really good. And hopefully as the report comes out, we're working on that now, Jim and I. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll see what happens. If we can get that report out, then it will be – people will see the benefit of this kind of a competition. But we can't forget OFSEC – Offsec uh, should mention them first, but I left the best for last because without their support, these events that we do here would not happen. And uh, Offsec's got a slew of um, uh, live training going on right now. They have the St. Kitts class, PWB St. Kitts, which is happening in November. Um, uh, yeah, they have a, a all class. This is actually there are two all classes. The first all outside of Black Hat. And Matteo added a, a fifth day of training yes. and, a, and yes. a certification. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yep, yep, and a certification. Ridiculous. Do you uh, take the cert in the class or you take it online? No, it's going to be like all the other certs. It's because it's going to be like okay. two or three days or something ridiculous. There is no yeah. way I am going for that. I'm telling you guys that right now. You, you know you will. No. no. Yeah, you know you will. You know it. No. <laughs> you no. will. You will because yeah, when probably, dual core passes yeah, at first, because when, when dual core <laughs> passes at first, then you'll be really upset, you know. So I'm gonna have to probably do a refresher, man, because uh, I'll tell you, the OSCE was very miserable. I mean, how, how, how long is this test? I, I I think Matteo said he can't make it longer than 48 hours because that is ridiculous. But it has yeah. to be it has to be twice as hard as the OCSE. Ah. Uh. Right. So I don't even know what that means. How do you fit twice as hard into 48 hours? Well, I'll be honest. I mean, I, I if it wouldn't have been for – I mean, I, I, I passed OSCT in probably about 24 hours. And so, you know, the rest of them I had to get all the flags because I know you guys would ridicule me ridiculously if I didn't. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I had the rest of the flags I got. But, I mean, you know, it was down to the crunch um, towards the very end there. I mean, I – you know, one of it was a, a clerical error that I didn't read the actual PDF, um, you know, when I um, sat there and rewrote shell code over and over and over and over and over and over again. It didn't work because I didn't read the PDF. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I don't know it how you can make it. all instructions first? Yeah, just it, it hints for anything that you do in life. Read the instructions yeah. first. Yeah. Just, I just, yeah, with a friendly word of advice, you don't make the same stupid mistake that I did for 12 hours. 12 yeah. hours. Um, but no, I don't know how you can make that twice as hard and still be able to do it within a 48-hour period. But I guess that's what I makes it so challenging. 
Yeah, maybe Mateo's figuring that many people who pass it are passing it within 24 to 30 hours, so he can make it twice as hard and have less people. Pa- I don't know. I really don't know what he's thinking. I don't, all you know, yeah. everyone knows. Anyone that knows Mateo knows he's just pure evil. So I, I don't know yeah. what what his thoughts are, but I know that we have an all class in Maryland, and in October, and an all class in Portugal in February, and uh, both of those classes are are actually getting a lot of um, a lot of interest right now. So yeah, I don't know, man. It's just they got a lot of training going on, and having this all thing coming out, it, it's gonna. I think it's gonna be a big deal. It's gonna be a big deal because they haven't had one outside of Black Hat since it started. Yeah, and that's, you know, for me, I mean, that was the hardest class that I'd ever taken. Yeah, most people say the same thing. Yeah, most people say that. So um, that PWB, I know a lot of people are asking about a CTP class. We don't have one scheduled yet, so that's uh, that's still in the in the works. Um, you know, anything that's public at least, not private classes. And then, um, and then before you know it, it will be back to Black Hat again in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So that's um, DefCon. I said the big news. Kind of, <coughs> kind of uh, excited about next year already. It just seems like, like uh, so far away. But I'm sure it will be right around the corner. It, it will seem that way when it happens again. Uh, let's see some other stuff we got going on. We launched uh, social-engineer.com. So we still have the org. The org is going to maintain all the podcast newsletters, the framework, all of the community work that we're doing. Uh, but the dot com, we moved over to uh, actually start selling some social engineering services like SE pen testing and, and awareness training and um, tr- our training, the actual five day course. That is so, I, you know, I just tweeted once like that the course is near done. And, and anyone who's interested should email me. And it was, I really did not expect the level of emails that came in, just dozens upon dozens, <coughs> excuse me, and, and um, really interested companies and people. So we'll see how that interest piles over when we actually start scheduling the date. Uh, we don't have that just yet, but uh, it will definitely be in the early part of 2012 uh, that we'll be doing our first class uh, for the social engineer pen testing course. So, uh, sorry, we've got a lot of stuff going on. <clears throat> um, I, well, can we congratulate you, Dave, publicly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you got, I just, you know, the news, I'm not sure if everyone heard, but now they will. Yeah, Dave just got a promotion. He's probably, I don't know if this is the truth, but I'm going to say it, the youngest CISO that I've ever heard of. Um, You're pretty close for, to it, man. For a major company, you know, not like mom and pop's uh, tech support company. You know, we're talking like a major Fortune, Fortune 1000. Company, uh, Fortune 1000 company, sorry. And uh, congratulations. She just got your, from what, just a week or so ago, right? Yeah, a couple weeks ago I got uh, I got promoted. So I'm really, really excited about the opportunity. And uh, it's kind of neat to see a, a hacker be a CISO, huh? Yeah, yeah just a tad. And, and, a, and a young <laughs> one at that. Yeah, yeah. It just goes to show you that... Uh, I mean, if you're a hacker, you got you can you can do that type of stuff. It's awesome. It's so yeah, that is kind of cool. Uh, I think that was kind of what got us so much of the not not your position, but I mean that message is what got us so much of the the press with the kids CTF. Is that was the message we've been telling people? If you have an interest in this, if you like hacking stuff, it doesn't mean you have to go to the bad side. You can you can get a job doing this, and there's living proof, kids. Absolutely. Listening. Grow up and be like Dave. Wait, hang on. Ooh, I'll hang on. <laughs> I really yeah, got to refer. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, you actually, you actually should probably cut that part out of the podcast. Yeah, I probably should cut that part out. Any kids who are listening, just don't don't do that. Don't grow up be like Dave. Don't don't. Do it. <laughs> I got a new site to show you too, Chris. By the way. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> oh man. So uh, so the, today, what do we got going on? Um, we we got Kevin Mitnick. That's our guest. He's going to be on in just a few minutes. Uh, Kevin wrote a new book. Uh, I think this is his third, if I'm not wrong, uh, Ghost in the Wires. And I know I had a chance to read right. it. Jim had a chance to read it. I think Dave had I a read chance it. to read it, read it. So we all had a chance to read the book. Um, did you just say, by the way, did you just say I had a chance, uh, Dave had a chance to, to read it? Read it. I did. Okay. I, I meant I wanna, to say I Dave read it. I meant to say Dave also read it, 
but I completed the sentence as I did the other two, and then, uh, you know, there was a, a buffer overflow of the mind. Yeah, I just wanted to point out uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm, well, I'm glad your, that you your grammar right there. No yeah, I'm glad, you know. No problem. So, so Dave had a chance to read it, you know, because he, he reads things a lot. Yep. He's a redder. Yep. He's always and, on Reddit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, nothing changes with you guys. No, not really. So uh, Kevin will be coming on shortly. We'll get him on the podcast, and we'll talk about the book. Uh, we're going to actually do a different interview than we uh, than we than we do with uh, normally, and a different interview than I think that Kevin has gotten with the recent press all over the world with the book. We're going to actually talk to him about some. It's blown up. I mean. He's been all over the place. He's been on major TV um, news stations, Comedy Central, CNN. He was on CNN the other night. I like yeah, watching CNN, and I'm like, what? Kevin Mitnick's on Skype on CNN. I'm like, is that really his house in the background? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, He's living it up. Me. So, yeah, it was, uh, that's, been, that's been cool. Yeah, I mean, heck, he was all over. He was on a couple radio programs recently, too, as I heard. And, um, yeah. well, if you just follow his, tweet, his, his uh, Twitter account, you can see all the all the different programs he's going on. Usually, he's pretty good about keeping people aware of where he's about to be. Yep. Yep. And if, so, if you, um, oh wait, on, on a side note, did you hear about that uh, that service that um, it's kind of like LifeLock that uh, monitors kids? Uh, I'm not going for it. Not oh, not going for it. All right. Not not not. You see, your 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 pause was too much. Yeah, I know. I you have to you have to do it like when I'm in the middle of a yeah, yeah especially I know. when my emotions are involved, and then you get me, and that's usually when I yeah. You know, you know, what I'm gonna try to do next time is 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 probably go a couple um, like podcasts before, like like one of our first or second ones, and try to go through a story with that, and um, you know, let it go that for a while until until it sparks your memory. <laughs> nice, nice, yeah. You know, what I was laughing at was at DEF CON when that guy came up to the mic and started repeating my tyrant story. <laughs> that was ridiculous. I mean, really? Really? You're going to come up and you're going to pull a Dave Dave Jr.? And that's just... <laughs> you know, I'll be honest. I've had, I've had like five or six compliments, and they said, uh, they said uh, they're like, they're like, my two favorite things about the podcast, the first one is the uniqueness that, 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 that the, the Social Engineer podcast is able to bring with his guests. And the second is, is when you're able to get Chris and repeat an entire story. <laughs> that that those are the two fear. I've heard that from like five people. Oh, it's ridiculous. So I, I, I can't, you know, I, I tried doing it today and I messed up on it, guys. And I apologize to the audience. In fact, if you can cut that out, that'd be cool. Um, but no, you cut uh, it out. You know, yeah, I don't want to yeah, outplay I'm, it, so I'm I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. You know, a couple podcasts probably. You know, before I, I try to even think about doing it again. And I'm, I'm gonna actually rehearse it. Get a little, get a little better at it. And if you actually think I'm cutting out your failure, yeah, you, you're really mistaken. Well, listen, it's not like I read it. That's true, but yeah, yeah. But you dug it. I did, did dug it. Mama, did Next. your mama tell you to knock it out? <laughs> <laughs> Gut punch. <laughs> oh man, I tell you, really ridiculous, Jim. Ridiculous. Those are awesome, man. Those are awesome. no, no. no. <laughs> If you were going to really go 80, you'd be like, that's totally wicked. Yeah. Like, if we were in a conversation about the 80s, it might have been a different story. You yeah, know, like, we might have been able to get it, but... No, it was just it was just completely, like, random. Yeah, it really was. And yeah. the billions and billions of songs that exist on Earth, the chance of someone getting the LL Cool J reference... I mean, I guess I did get it, but it was, like, late, really late in the game. Well, no, the only reason you got it was because I was going to say... He so, said, "Mama, gonna knock you out." Of course, of course. After oh, you right. say it directly, right. you know you're gonna Kevin. hear that. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hey, Kevin. Hey, sorry I'm late. Nah, it's okay. We were just chatting. We were just chatting, waiting for you. How how are things? All right. I was in a uh, car accident. Some moron rear-ended a whole slew of cars, and then it went into a chain reaction. I got rear-ended pretty hard, and uh, I had to go to a chiropractor and that's why I'm late because I was waiting to see him. You were in a car accident? Yeah, car accident. I mean today, you you were hit today. Oh no, not today. It was uh, a few days ago. 
Holy crap, man. Well, no offense, you know, but that would have been awesome because that would have went on our themes for calling from crazy places. So if you would have came from a car accident. Yeah. I, you know, I usually call oh, I'm not that hospital. dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. I'm dedicated, but I don't know if I'm that dedicated. <laughs> you know, can you go out in the road and like tell us you're calling from the scene of the car accident? That'd be yeah, crazy. yeah. We're gonna we're gonna cut this car out and can you to, uh, to the traffic accident. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Reporting live from Las yeah. Vegas traffic accident. This is Kevin Minnick. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's three books now, right? This is your third. Third book, yeah. The first one was Art of Deception, which was as you know, social engineering uh, stories. And I had to fictionalize those stories because I was under an agreement with the government not to tell my own. And then Art of Intrusion, you know, Art of Deception was, you know, did so well that Wiley, you know, who you, who you know and love, right, <laughs> contacted me and uh, wanted to do another book. And so I was thinking, well, I can't write about myself. Maybe I could cover some other cool hacks. So I put out like a call to hackers to you know, or, or people that have been on the dark side uh, to tell me some of their stories. So I kind of picked the cream of the crop and we wrote about them. The one that I liked the most was hacking the Vegas uh, video poker machines. Um, the other ones, you know, you know, were, were somewhat interesting to me, but weren't as interesting as the Vegas one because there was a lot of uh, cleverness behind it. You know, and then, of course, we all know what the third book is. It's finally, you know, after seven years, you know, after – I don't know, waiting. I, I talked about doing this book 10 years ago. We finally got it out. So, um, awesome. so it's, it's nice. Yeah, I, we, we have the, uh, Jim and I have already read it, and uh, we loved it. <laughs> oh, Jim? Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah no, he, he's I've got to read your yeah. book, Chris. I mean, I've been so busy, uh, like, dealing with stuff. I'm going to read your book, don't worry, because I'm actually going to just download it. I'm not going to read the hard copies. I mean, I'm just going to uh, put it on my, uh, my iPad. You're just going to pirate it, right? You're going to pirate it? No, no, I don't do it. Actually, I, I already saw Chris's book out on PDF. Mine is already out there, you know. But yeah, yeah. If I wasn't, I'd be. If I wasn't, I should be worried because then nobody wants to see it, you know. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. what I think too. You know what Jim usually does is if he finds it pirated, is he downloads it and then tells me. Yeah. 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 No, but I saw yours because I googled you, uh, or Art of Human Hacking, and then it came up Art of Human Hacking PDF. I wasn't. Sure, if it was real or you know, because you know, you know that game, but yeah, uh, um, yeah I, I I heard your. I mean, my book was already on the torrents the the, the day after release. Yep. So, yeah, but, yeah, but you know, ridiculous. It's, well, to me, it's good because more people will know the true story rather than a lot of the myths. So. Yep, that's true. It's actually, a that good thing. True. That is true. So, were all three of your books? Um, were all three of your books uh, New York Times bestsellers? No, uh, the last one was. I think this is the only hacker book um, that became a New York Times bestseller. The only one that I, I checked into it, I couldn't verify that it had because uh, I really liked it as well as uh, Cuckoo's Egg by Cliff Stoll. Mm -hmm. I, and I love that book. You know, it was, a, it, it was like a page turner. And I went looking to see if it actually hit the New York Times bestseller list, and I couldn't, I couldn't find the answer. So, uh, and usually it will come up because the author obviously wants to say that. So um, That happened fast, didn't it? I mean, like you were in the New York Times bestseller list. It was a week after it came out or something? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, that, so it's is, actually... Is that abnormally fast? I don't know. You know, I, I, I really never expected it to hit the New York Times bestseller list. Um, <laughs> but it's actually moving up. It's actually 16 this week, and it'll be 13 next week for hardcover, and it's already in the top 10 for electronic copy. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's going to go up and down. So it's like number eight now, um, which is a huge, uh, you know, uh, a huge compliment. You know that people. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. People congratulations love on that, man. Really. And what's cool is the story is real. You know, it's not fiction. So uh, that's, you know, that's odd for a New York Times bestseller, isn't it? What? That's odd for a New York Times bestseller because usually they're they're fiction. Yeah. Well, no, they have no. They have uh, uh, basically categories, and there's you know s several books that like hit the bestsellers list, like uh, Pen Juliet, you know, of the Pen and Teller. Uh, his book, God No, is also you know we're kind of uh, next to each other. First, he was ahead of yeah, me, and I went in ahead of him, so we're like in this race. So I actually emailed Teller 
uh, a couple days ago and say, hey, you know, Penn and I are in a race on the New York Times bestseller list. Maybe we should do a book signing together. <laughs> so, <laughs> I haven't funny. heard back, though. Um, yeah. I know it was a little less formal than normal. Oh, no, it would be a but... cool intro, though. It's like, too bad I don't have it. I used to host a talk radio show in Los Angeles called The Dark Side of the Internet, and they, they created the bumper into the show. You know, like, you know, like, it was like a Superman thing. Like, he could whistle the launch. Co- it was hilarious. <laughs> and uh, I, I wish I could find an old recording of that because that would be funny, you know, for the humor factor. Yeah. Because you know, they really played it up, good. you know, like, what? That would be good, yeah. Yeah. Maybe but we can I, find it online. Jim, you can find it anything. It's called Dark Side of the Internet. If you could find the show, it was on KFI AM 640 in Los Angeles. Um, it would be cool. I, I haven't looked for it, so. I don't know if it's on any torrents or anything. So let, I want to, you know, we kind of want to take a different approach because um, you, you, you've been talking and getting interviewed so much um, on the book, which is awesome. So I think a lot of people know a lot about the stories that are out there. But there's some things that I think it would be cool for you to have a chance to answer to. Like a lot of people uh, were complaining about you saying that you have a big ego, that you step on other people all the time just to get yourself ahead. How do you how do you respond to people that are constantly like berating you online and you don't really have an audience for that? Well, I I know there's a lot of trollers and I think these people that are making the comments don't know me personally. I think they just see a lot of press about me about the book and they don't really know me and say that because I haven't no one has actually said that to me face to face. You know, uh so I think I'm a pretty humble guy. You know, I'm not like the the arrogant guy that uh, that thinks that they're smarter than everybody else. You know, that, you know, I go to DEF CON, Black Hat, and other security cons actually to learn from others, right? Because nobody knows it all. So it's kind of unusual because it's the first time I actually heard that, uh, and I'm wondering if the people that actually say this are people that actually have met me and interacted with me. Or are these people that really don't know me that just have created a persona in their own mind? Well, and one thing I can say, I mean, Kevin, I've known you for, for several years, and, and, and this isn't uh, one of those, those kiss, kiss butt moments or whatever, but um, I was trying to keep a PG there. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I was, you know, the way that we communicate back and forth, it's, it's, it's definitely as peers, and, you know, and, and so I can, I can honestly say from knowing you that that's, you know, completely fabricated and uh, everything that, that I've known you for, I mean, it's been, you know, completely um, awesome. You know, we're, we're pretty good friends when it comes to all that stuff. And, you know, I, I, I have a good tendency to, to not hang around uh, the, the side of the, the security industry that, that has the inflated ego. I mean, those are pretty easy to pick up and uh, not a personality that I'm very keen with. And uh, that's nothing that I've ever detected in any capacity. No, and, and, and I think people I, like I hang around with, like, uh, you know, I hang around with a small circle. Maybe people are upset. I sometimes get lots of emails from people around the world, and I just don't have time to respond to all of them. You know, so maybe people think, well, he's not answering me because he thinks he's better than I. But that's not the case. It's the case that I'm, like, extremely busy, and I'd love to be able to answer everything. Um, but sometimes I just can't, you know, so pe- people have to be patient. But, you know, I don't think I ha- I'm the type of guy that's uh, arrogant, you know, and uh, – um, and I hang around, you know, a small circle of people. It's not like, uh, you know, I'm really visible at these cons. You know, I when I meet someone, I, like, shake their hand, nice to meet you. But, you know, there's very few people. I mean, and Dave, you're one of the guys, like, you know, the kind of I communicate with more, you know, because we share similar yeah. interests. You have your awesome set toolkit that I, uh, F, you know. Which, by the way, I think I think you're the number one uh, bug contributor to set. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's an awesome tool. I mean, uh, I wish we would have spoken months before this because how I learned about you was actually uh, I came across the social engineering toolkit and just go, man, this this thing is so damn cool and awesome. You know, I gotta I gotta you know ping you and you know that's how we actually established communication. So yep, yep, that was about two um, years ago, I think. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, this whole thing of people thinking I'm arrogant or whatever. I think it's coming from people that really don't know me for me, but uh, kind of have read about me and formed opinions based on other people. So I think you get that a lot, though. Anytime you're in, I'm definitely like I'm nowhere near having the people know about me like you do. I mean, you're with your uh, with your history. But when the book came out, I had a lot of people doing the same thing, like writing reviews and saying stuff about me as a person. 
uh, based on what they read in the book, you know, and like kind of judging me uh, about about me as a as an individual. People that had no clue who I was or what I'm about. So it, it, it is interesting how people do formulate their opinions and think they know everything about you when all they have is just a couple books to read. You know, <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. And, and the whole thing, like with like Shimamura, when my you know my dealings with him, and now this guy was arrogant. You know, you know, Satomi Shimomura was, you know, credited with helping the government eventually capture me. And this guy, I mean, even if you read his own writing in the in the show, I mean, on the show in the book Takedown, this guy, you know, is arrogant. You know, and I'm I'm completely opposite of that. So I don't know. Well, if I have ever offended anybody, I apologize. You know, and you know, and let bygones be bygones and move on. Why was Shimomura so after you? What was his What was his gig? Why Why was he like? (laughs) Well, I kind of drew first blood. I mean, I did, you know compromised him uh, because I was interested in getting a copy of the Oki 900 source code. I wasn't sure of him and a fellow named Mark Lauder who was developing the C-Tech. It's the uh, Cellular, God, I forget what the acronym is. It was a, a, like an Oki Cellular Phone Toolkit. And I had compromised Lauder and found out Shimomura was involved. And then when I compromised Sun, I got into Sun's bug database and saw that Shimomura was submitting a lot of exploit. Uh, exploit code and uh, vulnerability information. So what I did is uh, I targeted uh, Shimomura to get the information. And what's in the book, what's not in the book is back in my day, you know, why I didn't become a security researcher and start learning how to, you know, detect and find vulnerabilities on my own. My time was preoccupied with compromising all the security researchers to get copies of all the bugs they were discovering. And that was the tack I took because my goal wasn't to be the best at doing reverse engineering and security analysis. My goal was to have the best toolkit in getting to anything I wanted to get into. So that's the route I took. You know, at the, and I mean, there was like I think all the major security researchers at the time uh, we had compromised, and um, probably that still happens today. We just don't hear about it, or when we do, mm-hmm. it's uh, groups like that like to go very public when DEF CON and Black Hat's rolling around. Yeah. 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 Have that's, you had any contact exactly. with them since since you've been out of prison? Is is this? Uh, do you have a relationship with them now? With who? Shimomura? Yeah. Uh, no. no. No, I never. I never had any communication with him uh, except the, the day. Well, I never even spoke to him except when I saw him in court on February 15, 1995. And since he was uh, effective at helping the federal government capture me. I, you know, I tipped my hat figuratively and said, I respect your skills because he won the game, in my opinion. So, you know, I had to concede to the winner, and that was why I said that, you know, years ago, and the media really played it up. But that was the purpose, was kind of, hey, you won the game, congratulations. Because to me, hacking was a game. That's why. In the the book, you know, it kind of leads into that thought. In the book, you you mentioned it seemed like every time you moved around, you went to one city to another, like the first thing you did was was hack the phone system or compromise the phone system and and kind of figure out how it was set up and then own different sections of it. Um, Now, that was, you know, back when you were were doing all this, do you think that the phone system is still as vulnerable today as it was back then? It's hard to tell because I haven't actually been on any pen test of any uh, tele- te- you know, uh, telephone providers, but I would I would assume if I wanted to get in, I could. Um, back then, um, back then it was it wasn't that difficult. I mean, they had dial-ups into switches that didn't even require passwords. Uh, they used a lot of security by obscurity, meaning the secrecy of the dial-up number was how they protected access to some of the switches. And those were the ESS1A switches, like the other ones, like the DMS and the ESS5, or the 5 ESS, you know, those required credentials. But that was my method of operation, or my modus of operandi, was to compromise the local telephone company infrastructure of wherever I was to make it very difficult to track my communications. Because then I'd be, what I'd be able to do is to route my communications, you know, lo- you know from the local switch and fool anybody that was trying to track me. And that actually worked um, when Shimomura uh, closed in on my location as they tried uh, tracing back the number um, and found when they called it, it just didn't go anywhere. It just went into a loop, so to speak. And then, and then Shimomura had a clever idea 
of doing what they call a terminating number search. And what that was, was they had likely numbers that I would be dialing that were netcom dial-ups back in those days. And what they did is they just searched any cell phone number or subscriber that called a list of these numbers, you know, within the last week. And then they were able to identify the cell phone number I was using at the time. But when they actually tried to trace back a call in the netcom, what they identified was a cutout, a cutout number that I set up in the switch. So, um, uh, so eventually they figured it out, but it you know took them some extra steps. So here's here's a hard oh. one. I mean this, you know, and this this could be a one you might not want to answer. But it, what's the biggest mistake you'd say over all the years that you ever made? Trusting people. Uh. Right, because, you know, how I was caught in most of my hacks, except the last one, over my entire lifetime was people snitching on me. I mean, in every, every time, uh, that's how I, how I was identified. In the last one, it was more, you know, about Shimomura, you know, using some clever investigative tools with the phone company and the FBI giving him access to everything that a normal civilian wouldn't have access to. So, um, in all the other times prior to that, it was always because of informants. So I trust Why do you think that is? I mean, it seemed like throughout the book, at least throughout, throughout Ghosts and the Wires, um, it seemed like every time you turn into a new chapter, there's someone else screwing you over. Why, why was it that so many people were stabbing you in the back every every time? Well, usually because they got caught doing something. And, you know, as all informants do to get themselves out of trouble, they'll, you know, turn and be a government witness. And then in one case, I uh, had a hacking partner that we had a falling out over we constantly challenge each other into breaking into each other's systems at work, and we'd have a bet going on. And this is detailed in Ghost in the Wires. So uh, at the end of the day, um, I kept winning, and he got really pissed off. And so I meant to play a practical joke on him because he says, well, I'm not paying you. And I said, okay, if you're not going to pay me, then you're not getting paid. You know, so I did a I tried to do a practical joke where I called up his employer, pretended to be the IRS uh, when I had a garnishment order to just to get his paycheck held up for the weekend because I knew he had plans the weekend. And uh, what happened is when he found out I did this, he went ballistic and then called Digital Equipment Corporation, who were hacking at the time, and tipped them off. Uh, he tipped them off that, you know, I was the guy. And uh, so that, that was the result of a falling out, but the others were – where people got themselves into trouble and had to find a way out. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of amazing just kind of reading through the chapters and sitting there and saying, man, every time you turn around, it's like someone, someone stabbing you in the back there. Well, it, basically, um, if you're going to do anything illegal, the smartest thing to do is never to work with anybody else to do it on your own. Yeah, you know, and sure. uh, But to me, hacking was a game, and it was always fun to share the results and the accomplishment of the hacks with at least one other person. So when I was, you know, doing this over the last 20, 25 years, I've always had one or two hacking uh, partners at a time, you know, where we would team up and work together. It was never like, you know, a group of five or six. It was very, you know, it was usually like one or two because we shared similar interests. And most of that was geared towards uh, telephone companies. So does that, that, does that change all that? Has that changed like the way you are today now and the way you trust people today even though you're not doing criminal activity? No, because, I mean, basically, if uh, I don't have to worry about being informed on because I'm not doing anything illegal. So, you know, so it, uh, you know, but if my trust, uh, I guess my tr- uh, internal trust mechanism is I usually distrust before I trust, right, uh, because yep. of all the stuff I've experienced as I had in my life. So usually the default is I won't trust you until you earn that trust when normally in society is you're given you're you're trusted and you're given the benefit of the doubt until proven otherwise if you were if if you went back now like like not back in time but let's say you were 16 and it's 2011 so you know we're, we're in the present day but you're that age when you started all of this how do you think your life would end up being different now with the same interest same skill level it probably would be different because Back when I started, uh, computer technology wasn't affordable, so I basically had to like, you know, 
uh, steal, if you if that's a good word, computer time at like Cal, all the Cal State University North uh, Cal State University campuses in Los Angeles. So I'd go to their computer rooms just to get computer time to learn about operating systems and programming, and um, and I would have to basically hack into systems to get the time to learn. And today, well, you know how computer technology is available to you know, a, a six-year-old in school, right? So, right. Um, so I think I might have went on a different path if the tools to learn about security and, and hacking and phone freaking were available to me like they're available to people today. Well, that sounds like it would have taken you down a pretty, <laughs> maybe a worse path. So what advice would you give to kids today that have, like, similar interests to what you had at that age well, I would. Have, I certainly wouldn't want them to end up like in the, you know, taking the hard road like I did, you know, and ending up in prison. What I would say is uh, try to use a, you know, use a socially acceptable way of learning about, you know, security. I mean, take a take a course of offensive security. You know, uh, you know, get some good books. I mean, like Dave's Metasploit book. Um, you could download the tools and you could, you know, set up your own lab and attack systems. And then when you become skilled enough, you could actually get a job hacking. And not only are you having fun doing it, because I, I do that today, I, I, I really enjoy it, but you're getting paid for it and you're not going to end up you know, hurting anybody else and you're not going to end up hurting yourself and getting yourself in some legal mess. That's good advice. <laughs> That's good advice. So, um, yeah, I don't want to dominate. If you guys, I, you know, I just feel, I feel like I'm asking you all the questions, but I got a lot That's of... That's okay. I mean, whoever wants to chime in. Chris, yeah. you're pretty much doing the whole thunder here, man. Just letting you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, how about, um, do you have any, like like nowadays, um, you know, you're not doing anything illegal, obviously, but do you have any fake identities lined up just in case? <laughs> well, you know the old adage, if I told you it, I have to what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll take that as a maybe. <laughs> Yeah, well, if I, if I did, I certainly wouldn't be telling you on this program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well, we can edit it out. Yourself. Yeah, we can we'll, edit, we'll edit it out. It out. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you trust us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. You'll keep <laughs> it a secret. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, Jim, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I, I thought I heard you try to say something and I cut you off. No, it's fine. One of the things that... I think was a, a reoccurring item, especially in the, in the second half of the book, is just how the reputation of Mitnick was outgrowing what it was that you were doing, and, and it, you were getting caught in this tidal wave of of this reputation. And now that you're out of, of you're you're on a different path, you're you're doing, you have a, a good life. And but you still get this this criticism. I think a lot of the, this criticism is aimed towards that reputation and not towards the real person. Do, do you feel that the um, the reputation that you have to carry and and knowing that everybody's watching you all the time and, and people like to tear down icons is that is that a burden to you or is that something that you get that, that there's good use that you get out of? Well, it's definitely it's there and it's a challenge. You know, because of my criminal history with hacking. You know, sometimes it makes it difficult to, you know, uh, to get to get trust. And I think since, you know, over the last what 11 years, I've been, you know, very legitimate, very high profile in the security marketplace. That you would think that companies would say, hey, you know, this guy's on the street and narrow, and he could really help us. But there's some that you know just don't forgive and you know don't forgive. And uh, and one example is ISC squared who I found hmm. out had contacted a security conference that I was hired to speak at. And um, what they did is they told that conference, if you ever hire Mitnick to speak again, we're going to yank our sponsorship. So the conference, and this is a very well-known conference, so the conference you know, told my agent, you know, we'd love to have Kevin back. He did a fantastic job, but we just need the sponsorship. And you know, ISC Square told us if we you know, have him back, we're, he's going to yank our, they're going to yank our sponsorship. So... I was kind of like going, Jesus Christ, you know, that, you know, for them to go to that length of, mm -hmm. you know, of vindictiveness was pretty surprising. Especially 11 years later, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but then again, you have people that um, just 
you know, hold a grudge. I mean, yesterday I was uh, at dinner with uh, Christopher Hoff and a couple of other guys, and one of this uh, this other gentleman worked for DEC when I was ha- mm-hmm. when I was heavy into hacking EasyNet, and I even hacked into his Vax cluster that he managed. And we were sitting there having drinks and kind of laughing about the good old times because I was telling him what he was, you know, uh, I was telling him what I was doing. He was telling him what uh, he was telling me what they were doing, and we were just laughing and having a, a grand old time. But unfortunately, you know, there's some people out there that just, uh, you know, hold a grudge, even though, you know, years have passed, which is unfortunate. Well, that, that, that's a good point. You mentioned throughout the book, you talk about uh, conversations that you've had with some of these these previous victims, and it sounds very personal. It, it sounds like th- there's there's no real animosity left with a lot of those people. Is, is, was that first time talking to some of these people? Was there any awkwardness at all, or is it pretty much bygones, yeah. bygones? No, it's like bygones, uh, you know, like one one uh, guy who is, I, I consider him a good friend, uh, uh, Sean Nunley, he worked for Novell. He's now with Fusion IO. And um, we're, we're very good friends, and he was the guy I called at Novell and tricked him into setting up an account on a, mm. uh, a terminal server in San Jose because I had access through the firewall, but I thought that was high risk of being mm-hmm. detected, so I wanted some dial-up somewhere else. And... Uh, what ended up happening is he did it, but he felt uneasy about it and saved, you know, he had me call his work number and leave him the password on voicemail, and he ended up saving that. And eventually that went to, like, some investigative team in San Jose. You know, they couldn't match a voice to a person. Eventually, months later, it worked its way down to the FBI in Los Angeles. They played the recording, and immediately, you know, those agents know who, who it was, you know, like we're good old friends, Right. Mm-hmm. They, go, mm-hmm. they told Sean, well, we have some good news and we have some bad news. The good news, we know who it is, Kevin Mitnick, but the bad news is we can't find him. And so what ended up happening is um, as the case went on, I, I believe a prosecutor had told Sean, you know, that we're, gonna, you know we're, we're violating Kevin's rights and we know that, but why we're doing it is we want to send a message to any would-be hackers not to even think about what he's doing. So at that point was kind of a turning point where he felt, well, wait a second, if they could violate Kevin's rights, his constitutional yep. rights, they could violate mine. And then he actually contacted my attorney, and uh, eventually, you know, uh, I was in contact with him after the whole case was over, and now we're good friends today. So it, Interesting. It's, it's, it's actually brought me together, and I've met awesome people, you know, even though it was done in an unethical matter, manner in the beginning. So, I, uh, so I'm pleased to have him as a friend. Have you ever had what? like a reaction that was not that positive? You know, where people. Oh yeah, I, I did a book signing in uh, where was it in Boulder, Colorado, uh, with with Art of Deception, and I was living in Colorado, working for a law firm called Home Roberts and Owen for a little bit over a year, and I was the one tasked with connecting the law firm to the internet. So I contacted this uh, ISP at the time called Colorado Supernet. And I was um, I was uh, uh, introduced to a guy named Hank Latham, and to Hank, you know, I played like the dumb IT person that wanted to get an internet. Now I always was playing dumb because I didn't, I, I definitely didn't want to be remembered, and mm-hmm. I just wanted to be like the average no-brainer IT guy, you know. And uh, and so at the same time, you know, he was working on setting up the law firm stuff. I was completely compromising Colorado Supernet and using that as a hacking base. So eventually, when I did a book signing in Colorado, this guy actually you know, showed up at my book signing and actually got into my face like he wanted to have a fist fight in front of the whole crowd of nice. attendees that were attended the, the book signing. And that was like surprising because this guy really, really was angry. And eventually, you know, uh, the bookstore kicked him out. But... It was like oh. it was a surprise because I only had that happen once. Now, what about like your relationship with law enforcement? Is is there any positive feelings there at all, or especially well, I, after I, everything I, negative I, they've I've done? I've been to hired to speak for InfraGuard and for other law enforcement agencies and even intelligence agencies. Um, uh, I've been hired to consult with uh, uh, a government agency as well, so. I think, you know, I don't think they would be even thinking about hiring me unless they knew for certain that I was, you know, on the straight and narrow these days. 
Mm-hmm. And why I, while I suspect that there are certain agents and uh, law enforcement people that are still upset with me, you know, because, you know, I did play a cat and mouse game with them, you know, then others have, you know, uh, forgiven it and realized I served my time and I was punished. And now, you know, everybody should move on towards a positive direction and not hold any sort of animosity. At least I don't. I mean, you know, at first I was very angry with John Markoff and Shimabura and, and, and the government because they really, you know, there was a lot of hyperbole behind my case, even to the point where uh, because they said I could launch nuclear weapons by whistling into a phone, I was held in the hole for a year, or about a year. Mm-hmm. It was about eight and a half months. So, you know, normally, you know, probably any other guy would still be pissed off with a chip on his shoulder, but I've, I've just let it go and say, hey, life is too short to have a chip on your shoulder. Uh, why not, you know, try to live life in a positive way where you're going to enjoy your life? And so I, I kind of moved on. Now, the the solitary confinement part is something I think is important to bring up because it really seemed as if that time that you spent in solitary was a big catalyst for your reaction to run when it looked like you were going to get in trouble again. Is that accurate? Oh, absolutely. Man, I was, I was petrified. You know, here a federal prosecutor tells a judge that I could hack into NORAD and launch a nuclear weapon by whistling modem tones. And, of course, when that happened in court, I laughed because – I never heard something so ridiculous, and I thought the prosecutor was going to lose all his trust and credibility. Mm-hmm. And when the judge bought it hook, line, and sinker, and I end up in the hole, you know, for a year, then I'm out, and then I'm on supervised release, and then I'm involved with hacking again. And then one of the you know primary primary reasons that I went on the run is I figured, you know, if they if they caught me because they actually sent an informant named. Justin Peterson, who was going under the name of Eric, Eric uh, Hines at the time, if you know they had enough goods on me to put me back in custody, I had no doubt they tried to stick me back in solitary confinement under the guise that I could do something you know as ludicrous as launching nuclear weapons. So of course I ran, um, and you know uh, I still stand by that t- decision today because that's exactly what the government did when um, when I was arrested in North Carolina. They stuck me in solitary confinement. And the only way I got out is my attorney agreed to give up certain rights that were a part of, you know, you know, criminal defendant's rights to give up those rights in exchange for being let out of solitary. So mm-hmm. they definitely use that as a bargaining chip. So, um, so anyway, that's, you know, that's why I became a fugitive. No, I'm th- there's been, a, I, I was just, I'm not a lawyer at all, but it just seems to me like that's got to, there's got to be some level of illegalness there on the government's part. Like, uh, you know, as a prosecutor, if I if if I was a lawyer, I would imagine you would grab a an expert and say, "Is this humanly possible? Can someone actually whistle modem tones into a phone? And if so, could a modem tone Chris, launch their to, weapon?" I just wanted to point out, you said illegalness. Thanks. Illegalness. <laughs> yes, I, I, that's a new that's word. A new word. <laughs> I'm I'm coining it. It's the it's the you know when things are like illegal. You know, their illegalness. Right. No, I understand. But don't. there was lots of other uh, false allegations thrown at me at the same hearing. One was that I hacked into TRW and destroyed a prior judge's credit report, which never happened. Uh, there was an allegation that I, I disconnected the, uh, the actress Christy McNichols' telephones and stalked her, which was completely fabricated. Um, there was an allegation that I hacked into the police department's uh, computers, the state of California, and erased all my records, which, you know, there was an arrest record that was missing because they, they forgot to fingerprint me, and that was their own screw-up. And then, and then <laughs> cra- the, cra- the most, I guess, the cra- well, the second craziest accusation was that I hacked into the National Security Agency, and how they uh, framed that to the court was I had a file. Um, if you remember when you used to do a Who Is?, it would give you the registered, name, uh, uh, registered users of the, of the host and their telephone numbers and extensions, if you remember mm-hmm. those days. Yep. Well, I did a who is on a host called DocMaster, which belonged to the National Security Agency, and it listed all the registered users and their telephone extensions. So the prosecutor characterized that as secret access codes into NSA computers. So not only could I whistle the launch codes, but now I hacked the NSA uh, attacked federal judges, uh, stalked, you know, uh, celebrities. I mean, they painted this picture that later on, you know, the, the federal government admitted, you know, was all rumor. 
Mm-hmm. And but I was punished based on that rumor or on all those rumors. You know, so, so with with all those those kind of false allegations and just not possible allegations that were that were leveled against you, with those leading you um, or leading them to place you into solitary like that, and, and now that that you've been out and, and you've obviously gone through that experience, have you? Uh, been involved at all in any of the the sort of like more modern uh, human rights campaigns against uh, the use of solitary at all? Is that something? No. Is your story part of that at all? Or no, no. I, 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 you know, I've learned that the federal government does whatever they want to do. They have, you know, they're like a machine with an unlimited amount of money. So they're going to do exactly what they want to do. Why? While I appreciate how you know great the Free Kevin movement was. It actually had no effect on law enforcement or the court. They can care less, and mm-hmm. they they just do what they want to do. I mean, um, the federal judges are extremely powerful. They're like you know independent kings and queens, and to fight the system, unless you have a lot of money, is impossible. So, basically, you know, trying to make change would uh, I, I I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. So no, but when Dmitry Skalarov was arrested at DEF CON for exposing a bug in Adobe eBooks, I actually picketed in Santa Monica, California with a bunch of other people because we believe what, you know, the government, you know, accusing him of violating the DMCA was not right. So uh, mm-hmm. I remember participating in that, and that was a, kind of a cool thing. Now, is there anything that can be done that, that you're aware of to try to change that situation in order to protect people so that these we don't have this revolving door of, of these situations just happening to different people every few years? Jeez, I, I have no idea. I mean, like what would happen with me is I was actually detained for four and a half years without a bail hearing, which was, you know, in my attorney's opinion, I'm not a lawyer, was completely unconstitutional um, under this uh, thing called the Bail Reform Act that requires that any uh, person that's accused of a crime, they have a right to this mini-hearing where the government has to put on evidence, the defense puts on evidence, and then the judge decides based on this little mini-hearing if there's any uh, condition or or combination of conditions that could assure that you'll appear for for, uh, court for trial. And in my case, the judge basically said, I'm not even going to give Mr. Mitnick a hearing because there's no way I'm letting him out. And we litigated this all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court who – eventually decided not to even review it. And while, you know, in hindsight, even if we had that mini-hearing, I probably would have been detained because, I, again, I was a fugitive. But mm-hmm. for the government, you know, for the federal judicial system to deny that was kind of like, was like, wow, you know, is like that was a very strong message to me that the federal government does what they want to do. And, you know, unless, again, you have a lot of money, you know, you're going to lose. Don't you have, I mean, it just sounds to me like, don't you have a legal basis now to go after some of these people that, that screwed you over? No, not at all, because, uh, you know, when you make a deal with the federal government, you know, you, you sign a, a plea agreement and you basically give up all those rights. And eventually they let me out of solitary once I agreed to plead guilty. Um, in one of the cases, they... Uh, let me out, you know, uh, after I pled guilty. They wouldn't even, once I agreed to plead guilty, they still wouldn't let me out, but it was once I pled guilty in court, all of a sudden I was no longer a national security threat, no longer able to launch nukes by whistling into a phone. And so, of course, the common sense, you know, understanding behind that was it wasn't because they feared I was dangerous. It was that the government was using it as a, as a tool to get me to plead guilty. So I did. You know, and uh, after almost a year in the in the hole, you would probably do it too. Yeah, I I, I don't think it would take me a year, bro. I think uh, I think after just a short amount of time in the hole, I would probably I'd probably cave in. I think a year would is a little extreme. Yeah, and then in the last case, when I wanted to fight my case because I wanted to go and you know and admit, yeah, I hacked into all these companies and I did all these hacks, but based on this one case out of Boston, that was a federal case, a guy named Richard Sabinsky was an IRS agent who exceeded his authorized access at the IRS and started uh, looking at, you know, federal tax returns of celebrities and people he was interested in, and he was charged and convicted with the same crimes, wire fraud and computer fraud, and then he appealed it, saying, well, I did this really out of curiosity. I was not planning to profit or to make money 
uh, by doing this. And the appellate court said, well, since there was no intention to use or disclose the information for gain, then it's not a crime. And then so I wanted to take this case that was on the First Circuit Court of Appeals in, in the California, I was in the ninth. So it was law over in, you know, in New England, but not in California. And use this precedent to say, hey, I admit to I was a hacker and I broke into all these systems and looked at source code to create invisibility and to find security holes, but it was all for curiosity. And, um, and what had happened is the prosecutor, one of the prosecutors told my attorney that if Kevin decides to go to trial, that's fine because we're going to keep him detained without bail. But win or lose, we're going to put him on the bus. So I go to my lawyer, I go, what does he mean by the bus? Oh, he means that's kind of like diesel therapy. That's where they take you from federal jurisdiction to federal jurisdiction and put you through a revolving door of trials until, you know, they get enough bites at the apple until you're convicted. And then they hammer you, meaning they'll throw the book at you. So basically I was, you know, given a choice. You know, I could try going to trial and saying, yeah, I did these acts, but, you know, it's not a crime under this precedent, or, you know, plead out and sign the government's deal. So I thought it was highly risky uh, to not sign the deal because else I'd be put through a revolving door of criminal trial, so I signed and got out. Hmm. So let's jump ahead now, like 11, 12 years. So let's let's bump up uh, 11, 12 years now. You know, now you're... Uh, you're a professional security consultant, so you get hired to to actually hack companies and penetrate them and tell them where their weaknesses are. Um, do you think that it would be difficult for you to? Because it seems like, as reading goes on the wires, that hacking it wasn't just something you did because you had a talent or a skill. It almost seemed like an addiction at at some point. Um, do you you know Do you think that you would have a hard time controlling that if you weren't hired as a pen tester for companies today? Not really, because I, I kind of, you know, grew out of it, you know, and uh, and went involved myself in that type of activity. But I would say that it's definitely a huge positive that I could essentially do the same same thing that I was doing illegally, namely hacking into computer systems for my for pure thrill and entertainment. Now I could do it completely legitimately and get paid for it, and it's almost like it's not a, not a job. You know, I really. You know, I when I have projects, I definitely hire other people to participate. You know, uh, depending you know where I'm looking for different skill sets, depending on what type of the scope of the project. And but I always like to get my hands dirty and participate in the pen test because I really enjoy the work. Mm-hmm. And I'd probably make more money if I just did manage you know teams of people to do it and negotiated contracts and went that direction. But I enjoy doing it so much that, to my financial detriment, I actually get involved with hands-on stuff. <laughs> so do you, do you get to do um, many social engineering pen tests now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm mostly technical, but um, because social engineering is a hard test to sell. For some reason, companies don't understand the threat of social engineering and how effective it is. And, in, mm-hmm. you know, in pretty much in every pen test we've done to date, we've been 100% successful. But it's been much easier with the social engineering side. As you know, it only takes one person to make a bad decision and you're in. Yep. Right? Yep. So, you know, you know, you take a company like Microsoft that has thousands of employees, uh, how, how hard is it going to be to find one person that makes a bad decision? Not, not hard at all. So those are much easier tests, but technical and physical, you know, uh, we, we, I enjoy doing the physical pen test, the te- uh, you know, technical and the social engineering. I, I like it all. So, do you um, think do you that think social... Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, we're asking the same the, question. They probably have the same question. Go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think what we're both going to ask there is, do you think that social engineering should be included in every one of the pen tests that you're doing? Exactly. My I think so. <laughs> I, I think that social engineering is definitely a substantial threat. I mean, if you look at r- recent high-profile targets like RSA and... Uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, Google, that involves spear phishing attacks. I mean, I mean, it, it's a no-brainer. I mean, back in the day, was targeting uh, boxes on the perimeter. You know, as you know, and mm-hmm. um, uh, the problem is, if you get into a box on the perimeter, you're usually on the DMZ. So now you have to work from the DMZ to the internal network. But when you're dealing with a social engineering attack that's when you target somebody that has a machine directly connected to the internal network. 
So it's bypassing the need to bother with the DMZ. So that one person does a bad, you know, makes a bad decision, opens up that booby trap PDF file, game over. So well, why don't you know? You, know that- you guys do this yourself, so it's no secret. Yeah, right. no, but it's interesting for the listeners, you know, and, and this is a kind of a, a discussion that we have. It'd be cool to get your opinion on this. Like, what, why do you think that companies don't include social engineering in their pen test, even though you may offer it as, as part of every pen test? One reason could be is they believe it's always going to work. <laughs> so they, they rather not do it, or it's compliance. A lot of my clients, you know, are more concerned about being compliant rather than being secure. So they have to hire a security firm to do an annual security test. So, you know, so they hire our firm. We do it. We provide our report. In some cases, I found that some customers don't even fix the holes that were reported to them, you know, a year ago. Yeah. It's just like they need the pen test to be compliant. So I think a lot of it has to do with they, they either know it's always going to work or they're just doing it for compliance or they don't have budget or they don't understand how serious the threat is. Yeah, you basically have the same answer that we've come up with every time we have this discussion, and mainly it, it's exactly what you said. We feel clients, um, they, they they want the box checked off, you know, to go back to the board and say, yep, we, we had the pen test, look, we're good, and, and that's it. And uh, and many times we find the same thing that you find, is that the, the vulnerabilities that are uncovered are not even repaired by the next time a, uh, a pen test is done. Oh, and what I love is when I uh, compromise you know, the entire infrastructure and dump all the Active Directory, you know, passwords for all the employees is by doing an analysis, you could already figure out what the next password is going to be. Because of Mm -hmm. the password complexity rules, I already know, like, I have one client, I even told them this, don't use the same pattern, right? Because I already know what your next one's going to be. I know know what it is, you know, forever. (laughs) So, you know, and then they just, for some reason, don't bother changing the pattern. Mm-hmm. And then when I'm hired to do the, you know, another pen test a year later or six months later, you know, I'm already in because of the, you know, of them not, you know, following the suggestions or remediation, you know, that I, uh, that we, you know, put in the report. So, you know, and you probably experience the same thing. Yep. It's probably, uh, it's, uh, it's across the board. It sure is. Yeah, it's, it tends to be uh, unfortunately what we see as the case, and in, in this, and um, you know, in our practices too, is um, I, I hear sometimes too that um, people say social engineering is cheating. Uh, that that that's the reason why they, they don't want to include it. It's cheating. Uh, but then you uh, will ask a question like, um, you know, do the bad guys use it? Yeah, sure, they do. As a matter of fact, I think there was just an article in the Business uh, Weekly. Uh, from um, one of the anonymous guys who go kind of turn cheek and 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 not doing that thing anymore. Uh, I read it. Sparky. Yeah, Sparky I, re- I read it. In this, and it's social one engineering of the... used in every attack, right? Uh, it's it's crazy. Exactly. I mean, I don't consider it cheating at all. I mean, and it's funny because when people speak negatively uh, negatively about me, they said, "Yeah, all he did was he just called somebody up and asked them for their password." Now. I, I challenge you to, to go read my book if you think that if you think that's my the, that was in my you know my toolkit of social engineering was simply calling up and asking for their password. I mean, <laughs> I mean that that that's a very basic attack. And while that I, I use that rarely, you know, um, that's really not what I consider social engineering. It's setting up a con and uh, being able to uh, change the perceptions of the target and manipulate things around them, their perceptions, and build the trust and credibility where, you know, um, where they're going to fall for the attack. For example, when I uh, hacked Motorola, there was two, uh, two types of attacks on them where they were primarily social engineering, and in one of them I got one of the engineers to reveal his password. But it took doing a technical attack on a workstation within Motorola to get enough information about the target including a password that he uses somewhere else in the company to get him to reveal his current credential was only because I was able to technically, you know, uh, get access to this uh, workstation. It was actually quite easy at the time, you know, dump the password hashes, crack it, and but leverage that information in the social engineering attack itself. So if you read Ghost in the Wires, you could, you know, read about it in, in the Motorola hack. Right. 
Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jim. I'm sorry. No, I was, I was going to say that, that that that's very accurate. The, the one of the things that struck me in the book was when you explain a technical attack, you actually do take the time to explain how the steps were done. And and while they might be, you know, for instance, like the the Arhos attack, it would be very difficult to do in modern times. Um, the, for the time period that you were doing it, a lot of the stuff was pretty sophisticated for for what was was going on. And so I, I, yeah, I, and I, I mean, thought it was refreshing to see that technical detail in there. Yeah, there was a memoir. So people, I mean, I received criticism, I think, in one review because I picked up Mitnick's book and it only has these, you know, techniques that are dated. But, well, yeah, well, hey, guy, uh, you know, I, I was hacking until 1995. It's 2011. Right. You're not going <laughs> to get the new, the new techniques in there because it's a memoir. It's not a work of fiction. Right. right? So... Yeah, so it's kind of I like love criticisms. It's like oh, I like when people like dock me 90. two stars. <laughs> Some guy docked me two stars because he didn't like that I wasn't repentant enough. But <laughs> you're reviewing the book, you know, But what people end up doing is reviewing my character, which is interesting. Yeah, but yeah. it doesn't matter, you know. It, it, you know, I, I kind of chalk it up to whatever. But it's kind of interesting to see how people the psycho the psychology behind how people operate. It's fascinating. Now, yeah, how, how, speaking of those technical attacks, how do you feel about, uh, you know, so there's certain groups that use some of your history as part of their training material. You know, how, it, how does that make you feel? I mean, I, I think it's a good thing because then you're, you're educating people not to become victim. You mean, you mean educating people not to become victimized? I mean, I get requests all the time, hey, you know, I'd like to use, you know, something out of Art of Deception or a story to illustrate it to, um, this crowd where I'm doing a security awareness exercise, and I say, sh- I say sure to whatever I can, you know, and then in some cases I have to refer them to the publisher because of the rights issue. But, um, no, I, I don't mind it being used to help others. You know, it, I think it's a good thing. So if you had to take any any advice now for, uh, I don't know, I, I, was, I want to give like like two different categories, you know, just for companies today, like when we do our, I mean, you know, you were there. You were there at our at our social engineering CTF at at Vegas. Um, you know, you you were nice enough to give that speech and come back and sign books for people. But you you sat in. You saw some of these calls, and you saw that some of these people are not in the field. They're not security people. You know, they're just enthusiasts that come to DEF CON because they like uh, what happens there, and they're sitting in this booth making these calls, and they're getting unbelievable amounts of information out of complete strangers. Just, just by the asking, what what would you say uh, to to companies today? You know, as as yeah, a you need to train your this... people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Simple yeah, as I mean, that. You really need to train your people, and I think CTF could be invaluable as to playing some of these phone calls. Oh, you're not. You don't record them. I'm sorry. Well, maybe creating, you know, uh, doing your own CTF and recording the calls and demonstrating to you know the CSO or. A manager at a company, you know, look how easy this is. If you don't train your people, I can sit here and do a security audit of your web application. I could sit here and do a, a network and OS audit, um, and it doesn't matter because all the attacker is going to do is send, you know, uh, send a hyperlink or you know, click this Java applet like the, the, the great attack Dave has in set, you know, and the game is over, you know. And and attackers don't want to spend a lot of work getting into a box. Right, they want to, you know, they want to take the easy road, so they're going to make, mm-hmm. they're going to do it the easiest way, which is usually, you know, to do a social engineering attack. Um, of course, you know, that's not to mitigate having a good zero day, either. Right. But, you know, it's just, it's just the easier way for an attacker to what? get in if they don't have a zero day. So it's really something companies really need to think about, and uh, we hear about the ones that don't. They're the ones we hear about in the press that are being attacked. Day in, day out. We'd love to be able to record the unfortunate problem with the uh, federal law on wiretapping prohibits us in many states um, recording the conversations. And then in the states that we can record, um, it, it, it does a lot against us on uh, actually releasing the phone calls, even if we could record it. So right now we're trying to work. Ah, uh, okay. So it's legal. It's legal. Yeah, I didn't think about the release. Actually, you know, I could actually sue Shimomura because... Uh, if you go to the site Takedown, he actually intercepted some of the sessions, hacking oh. sessions, and arguably those were intercepted without a court order. But mm-hmm. even a, even if it was with a court order, what he has done is he's actually 
uh, shared the contents of those intercepted communications with the world, which is a federal offense. Maybe I'll get a lawyer to go after him. You know, I just, I just haven't bothered with it because, you know, I've been too busy doing productive stuff. But <laughs> that's the same thing. You know, you can't intercept somebody's communications, legit or not, and then publish them because that's a, that's a violation of it in of itself. Yep. Yeah. And unless you have their consent, you know, and and uh, that's that's what the EFF has kind of been helping us with to stay on the legal side, and that's how we get away with you can you can hear my phone call, you can be sitting in the next room as me, or I can put it on a speakerphone and you can hear it, and that's not interception. But as soon as a device gets record uh, starts recording that call, that's when we run into some serious issues with uh, with the law, and then especially if I post that call. So, you know, we're working on some things where we can take some calls maybe and edit them, edit out names, uh, make the call from a state where it's legal to record, and then put the, the phone call on the Internet for educational purposes. Uh, but, you know, we're playing with that idea right now with the, with the, with the legal peoples because we uh, are not sure really about how far this federal wiretapping law takes it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and not only do you have to be concerned about federal but you also have to be concerned about um, state, yep. state law. So, yep. you know, because California is like a two-cent, a two-party consent state. Federal is only one party. So now, you know, you got to be careful because I don't even know what Nevada is. But I think you can just Google it and uh, figure it no, out. No, Nevada's two-party. That that's the reason why when we come to Vegas, that EFF is like, like, do not record these. You know, do not record these phone calls. Yeah, and you're not going to play the 15 second uh, the 15 second recording either because it's going to tip off tip off the target. Yeah, you know. yep. yeah. We actually uh, we're thinking of um, that if we can do that, uh, like next year, like have um, a contestant come in and and just for fun see if they can actually do something like that. Like call a company, say the 15 second. You know, we might be record this call. Do we have your permission to record this call for training purposes? And then get them to say yes. That would be like the first. <laughs> attack vector, you know, and then see if once they say that, hit the record and bam. Uh, yeah, get extra, yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. extra get extra points. Yeah, extra points if you for can that. do this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be great. That, it would be an interesting vector to say. This year. Yeah, you know what, we're hoping next year, what happened this year, which was really positive for us, is when we, because we made such a big stink about it, and when things didn't work out, um, we had a bunch of companies ask us, you know, why things didn't work out. And we told them there was some fear in what we found and, and this and that, and we think that's still new enough that people don't know that we're, we're the good guys. But we had three companies afterward come up to us and say, you know, would we be able to sign up for that next year? So um, it's a potential. It's like a free well, social engineering pen test for them. It's a free test. Yeah, that's what we told them. And we told them, too, that we got, we got you, we have me, and we have Johnny Long, um, you know, three people with names in the industry saying that, heck, we'll, we'll make the calls. You know, we're not going to hand it off to to some somebody who might come in with malicious intent or as a joke or we don't know and we can't vouch for. We'll hand this kind of a call off to someone who we can vouch for. You know, and 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 that way you're getting your free social engineering pen test, and you're giving us the ability to make a, a professional social engineering call without the fear of any of us going to prison. So <laughs> that's you know we're hoping we're hoping to work that out by next year. You know, we got the news that we're invited back to DEF CON for sure. So we're, um, you know, we're going to be working on that over the next 10, 11 months and hopefully get that worked out. No, that's great. Fantastic. It would be awesome to have you do a call next year. It really would. It's been years since you've done one publicly, right? I mean, really years. Yeah, exactly. No, it's been a, it's been a very long time. But I do them, you know, privately when I'm doing security assessments all the time. But uh, Right. Um no, I haven't. I haven't done it publicly. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> Not many of us have publicly, but um, yeah, excellent, excellent. So, Ghost in the Wires. How's how's the? Uh, I mean, not, I'm not asking for sales numbers, but I mean, how's the interest level? It seems like everyone's been talking about it. Not just in the tech world. You know, it's not just like a tech book. It seems to be every time I turn on the news or radio or TV. I saw you on CNN the other night. Uh, that, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's doing very well. Uh, it's definitely being, uh, uh, you know, people are loving, you know, loving my life story. I'm getting a lot of good feedback on Twitter. You now, very few people, are, you know, have negative comments. Um, I've gotten a lot of good reviews, and uh, I think I think it I think it's a it's a great book. I mean, it's on the New York Times bestseller list for two weeks so far. So, 
you know, uh, it's like a catch me if you can. And uh, uh, and I told the stories using real names and real phone numbers. I mean, everything in there is real. I mean, there was a few names I couldn't remember, and in the front of the book, it it actually has a disclaimer. Of, I had to make up names for these, like you know, people like you know that I can count on one hand, because mm-hmm. you know over you know 25 years of doing this, sometimes you forget. But uh, I think it's a good story. Even when I pick up the book myself and start reading, you know, it actually captures my interest, even though I'm reading about myself, because the writing is done so well that I have to credit my co-author Bill Simon, because without him being involved in the project, this book would have probably taken me five years. You know, I mean. The guy's a fantastic writer. I mean, we had friction writing the book because we had different hours, and you know, I was I wanted to add a lot more technicalities in the book, but uh, uh, he did not, and uh, uh, we ended up compromising. And now, you know, you see the product. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's probably a good call because I know when I was writing my book, and and I wasn't I was trying to be more technical because I was writing it for our community. And and the editor kept coming back and saying, no, no, you know, if you want to hit a broader range of people, you got to take out some of this technical stuff. You're going to lose half your audience. So we ended up doing that at the end. And the book is still pretty technical, you know, in some areas, but um, we did take out a lot of that. And he was right. You know, you, you, you miss it. You would hit the few people that really understand a lot of that, and you would make them happy. But then there's probably a broader audience that won't enjoy the book if it's got all the the super technical stuff in it because they're going to look at that and and feel lost and then not feel in touch with the characters in the book. One thing that I really noticed about it that um, it's not really a question, it's just kind of an observation. Um, The book seemed to be ultra honest. I mean, to to a point where sometimes I've kind of felt really bad for you reading the book you know i mean you told like everything that happened to you in your life your childhood your your um all your mistakes i mean the every time you screwed up all the people that you screwed over personally um when you were when you were going through these stories and you were writing this all this stuff down and going through that did you say at any point like holy crap i really don't want to oh yeah like there. I, like one of the things that and i remember telling uh my close friends and family about is I can't believe all the stuff that I did. I mean, because, you know, when I reflect back, I could only think of, you know, the recent stuff, you know, from, you know, the, the mid-90s. But then when I reflected on my entire life, I go, oh, my God. You know, this was like, you know, I, I, I was a little bit insane, you know, and a little bit, you know, I was a little bit out of control. And it, I couldn't believe I did all these things. I was, you know, kind of a rebel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm reading through it, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you know, your wife, um, your your ex-wife, she sounded like a pretty awesome person, and and you know, at at that one point in the book, like where you're, you know, I'm, I'm done, I'm I'm done, I'm not going to do this anymore, and you can almost see, you know, even though I'm like a kind of a visual thinker, so you kind of see in her in her character in the book, she's like at that breaking point, you know, it's like at that point where. Man, this is it's like you can almost see it in the next chapter. It's going to end, dude. Come on, Kevin, stop hacking, you know. And, and then here <laughs> yeah, you are again, right. in the middle of the night, sitting at the computer, and and you know, and she's she's just frustrated as heck. And you're, I'm reading through this, going, wow, like complete honesty in, in a in a life story has got to be very difficult. It's kind of like walking around the mall naked, you know. It, yeah, well, I figured that uh, that's what my memoir was, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, and uh, I want to get, uh, you know, kind of give people a sense of the human interest stuff and my persona, who I am, rather than just having a book chronicling, you know, a chronicle of my hacks. So I think that is actually was a good idea because, you know, I think the book, you know, turned out a lot, a lot better. And, you know, and I was honest in it. Everything in there is, you know, 100 percent honest and uh, to the best of my memory, uh, now, I might have a date wrong or a time wrong or, you know, something, you know, inconsequential, but I figured I'd uh, want to tell the the honest memoir, you know, the, the honest story. And uh, and actually, there's so much other stuff that I had to leave out of the book because the page count was already uh, 50% over what we were contracted to do. So mm-hmm. the publisher almost was going to yank that content, and wow. fortunately, they kept it. So actually, I have enough material from you know that's not even in the book that I could write a second book if I had wanted to. <laughs> All right, I was, do, I was you think you're going to? Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Sorry. Yeah. Right, do you think you're going to do it? Do that second book? Or are you going to do a follow-up? I don't know. I mean, I had to like 
I had a list of hacks and stories and great things to tell, and I had to go through and eliminate stuff, you know. And I remember Bill and I, you know, saying, well, we've got to take out all these words, so, you know, figure out what stories you want to take. And he really wanted to ax the Kevin Polson one, and I thought that one was great, mm-hmm. where I, you know, uh, called him when he was in prison when I was a fugitive. And uh, that almost went out because of word count, but fortunately, the publisher left it in. So yeah, maybe there'll be like an addendum book, like just a book of hacks instead of um, another piece of the memoir. Because that, that was actually yeah. a question that we had: was were there some accounts or stories that you that you couldn't put in the book? Maybe not for space, but I was thinking like were there things that were left out on purpose that uh, you know you just said no way I could I can't I can't talk about this. It's just too it's too much. <laughs> not really. I mean. Um... I try to pick, you know, the best ones to put in this memoir, uh, but uh, but there was nothing I said, oh, I can't put in there because pretty much everything is past the statute of limitations. So yeah. I wasn't concerned. Was, right. was, it, was it a relief to finally get this get this story out there and, and tell your side of the story? Yeah, I was happy to do it because yeah, don't forget there were three books: uh, Take Down the Cyber Thief and the Samurai and John Lippmann's Fugitive Game, and uh, there was a movie that uh, was made about me that was inaccurate and libelous. And now it feels really good to get out the real story, what really happened. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe there'll be a movie on this book, huh? Like the, yeah, I have an agent that's actually shopping uh, the movie rights, and uh, <laughs> I already have interest. In ex- actually, the next call um, after, we, uh, after this podcast is finished is actually to somebody that's interested in making it into a film. So... Um, it looks like it will happen. I don't know when, but that's also exciting too because mm-hmm. as part of the deal, I would have to have some sort of control because I certainly wouldn't want it to end up like a swordfish or uh, the movie mm-hmm. Hackers, you know, because all the hacker movies that, you know, to date except, you know, you know, Sneakers, you know, I think are, you know, was pretty ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You've got to kind of do like a, like a catch me if you can kind of movie. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, cool I, I don't know how realistic that was. But it was a decent movie that seemed to portray his story, at least, uh, in, a, in a realistic light. Well, I know Frank, and what he told me is the uh, writers for the script used a lot of journalistic license. And that's typical. You know, what they do is they read a yeah. book, you know, um, and they focus on, you know, particular stories. And, they, you know, they try to tell a story in 90 minutes, two hours. So it's yeah. really difficult to do in my, in my case because everything is so intertwined. So right now... You know, who's interested is uh, there's uh, interest in doing a television series based on my life. So, and if, if that comes to fruition, then then there's enough time to really give the details that are necessary to understand. You know, the entire the entire. Story. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, a television series would give you definitely a lot more time, and it would be interesting to see an actual show based on this field. I think it brings up the obvious question that if a movie happens or a TV series happens, who do you want to have play you? Oh, just call me. Well, if it was a movie, I would say Edward Norton. You know, if okay. it's television, I have no idea. You know, I, I'm friends with uh, with Donald Logue. You know, so it'd be cool if he was involved somehow. I'm friends with Greg Grunberg. Um, you know, but uh, but you know who I'd like pick because I, I love you know I love his acting skills as Edward Norton. Uh, Jeff Easton, who's the showrunner for White Collar, uh, who wants to actually do the mo- movie, um, uh, suggested on Twitter Robert De Niro, and I laughed. Because <laughs> what is Robert De Niro, like 60 years old? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah I don't uh, think that would work. Just give me a call. I'll, I'll play you, Kevin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kidding. All right. It can be worse. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll mention you to Central Casting. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, don't do that. You'll lose your all credibility. The mention, be, the mention will be whatever you do, don't call this guy, but you'll still get yeah, <laughs> That's right. When he starts calling, ignore his calls. Yep. Yep. Kevin, I really want to thank you for all your time uh, here today. Um, uh, really great. Uh, if people want to find out, you know, let, let's do a little promotion here. People want to find out more about you, like what you're doing now, what your what your practice is, your work and your job. Where where can they go besides the book, Ghosts and the Wires, which they can get anywhere, Amazon, any online bookstore, usually brick and mortar stores. Uh, where where can they find more information about you? Well, you can go to ghostandthewires dot com. Right now, that points to a site that's kind of half business, half book promotion. 
that has a lot of information about me, but I'm working on, uh, actually I've been having quite a di- quite difficult time finding expert web developers slash designers, you know, that have good experience in HTML5, jQuery, CSS3, you know, because I've been putting out, you know, kind of a call, you know, I wa- uh, a call for these people to hire um, a web designer developer to help develop go- the Ghost in the Wire site, and so far I didn't like any of the portfolios. But fortunately, I, I think I found uh, a, a, a group of people that could work on the front end, so now I have to look for some back-end people. And then eventually I'll have the, ghost, uh, have the site ghostinthewires.com point, you know, to be its own site rather than just pointing to my corporate site. But, you know, you can go to ghostinthewires.com. That's probably the best bet. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. And, um, and people can follow you on Twitter. What's your Twitter account? Kevin Mitnick, so it's uh, dub, 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 I guess, twitter.com slash Kevin Mitnick. Excellent. So, so people can follow you there. Buy the book, uh, Amazon. We'll put a link on the on the show notes for it, too. I'm sure um, everybody that hasn't bought it yet will probably want to take a look at it. It's very, very honest and open book. We thank you for your, your time coming on the show today. And uh, before we release it, you know, usually we do it. It's the second Monday of every month. We'll... Uh, We'll ping you and and um, and give you the URL and stuff so you can promote if you like, and that uh, will promote it also heavily. Great. Well, thank you for having me on your show, and it's been uh, fantastic. And I look forward to talking in the future and seeing you at the next uh, social engineering CTF. You got it, man. We'll talk to you. We'll talk to you soon. I'm sure. All right. You guys take care. Bye bye. Thank you, Kevin. Bye bye. Man, that was a good interview. That was a really, really good interview. Yeah, I think uh, his his answers were really interesting um, for a lot of uh, filled in a lot of blanks. You know, um, I think th- those that haven't had the, the the opportunity to meet Kevin in person, I think that this will hopefully help. You know, show a little bit who he is as a person. Um, yeah, I think. I think too, like what was nice about it, and this is going to sound self-promotional, you know, for us. But what I liked about at least this interview, and it, it is a little bit, but you know, we didn't just come on and just talk about the book, you know, the book, the book. It was more about the stories in the book and his life and what he's doing now and how he felt about it. Uh, I mean, to me, I think when you read a book like that, because it's not really a tech book, it's not a, a hacking book per se. It's uh, he, he kept saying it; it's his memoir, so it's about his life. Mm-hmm. So you read a book like that. And you learn about a, a person, you know, and that's what I felt. Like when I read the when I read Ghost in the Wires, I felt like what I learned about was Kevin as a person. And it's easy to make a judgment on somebody when all you know is their online identity and the stories that you read in the papers. But you know, you look at the the end result, and here you got a guy who openly admitting to every mistake he ever made and all the people he screwed over and hurt and how many times he was stabbed in the back. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and when you look through a story like that, it's it's uh, pretty darn honest. And, uh, well, I think too that the thing the thing about Kevin is, you know, there's there's certain people. Information security as a community exists in a ghetto. You know, there, there's no way around that. There's very few people that have come out of the the information security ghetto into the mainstream and and get that attention on a regular basis. And Kevin is one of those people. And so, you know, whether he likes it or not, whether other people in the community like it or not. He, the community to the mainstream audience on a fairly regular basis. And it's, it's interesting to be able to, you know, look and see, okay, who is this guy that's representing us? You know, what, where is he coming from with a lot of these, uh, these answers that he gives and his perspective, you know, wh- where are those grounded from? You know, where, where, what did he go through in order to wind up with that perspective? And I, I think it, it makes it more understandable. I, I like this answer too. I mean, we kind of threw some hard questions at him. You know, I mean, if it was me, uh, some of those questions were difficult. You know, asking him about how do you respond to people who call you an arrogant jerk. And mm-hmm. I thought his answer was, you know, was quite good. It's, you know, I, I think it's an honest answer too. It's like, listen, are you are is he, are these people who know me? You know, is it my friends who are coming out and saying, you know, Kevin's an arrogant jerk, or is it people who who have no clue who I am and just read my stuff or saw me on a five minute interview online and now base you know, arrogance on that. Um, well, it's easy to make a judgment. I, you know, I remember when yeah. when my book came out, I had people saying the same thing uh, about me. You know, based on except it was accurate, and you're, and you're that, that was us, though. <laughs> that was saying that about you. 
Yeah, nice. That really hurts. That really hurts. Yeah. You know, but Dave, Dave's not here right now, and I expect that from Dave. But but from you, I I, I don't know. I just expect a little a little more, I guess. Well, it, it's down to you and me right now, bro. So I gotta I gotta fill in those those very. So you gotta few. fill in the gaps for everybody. What you gotta you gotta you gotta be Dave and Jim. Yeah, yeah. Man. So I'll give a stupid joke and the insult at the time. So. Great, great, that's, excellent. That's the plan. That's the plan. No, I, I think um, the other interesting aspect of this to me is, you know, um, where, where Kevin is at today. I mean, because you take away his reputation, you take away all that sort of thing. He's out there in the field doing the same work as, you know, a lot of us. You know, he, yep. he's doing the pen thing. He he's, has the same frustrations. He, he's hitting the same obstacles. He's having the, the same issues, you know, with when it comes to SE, you know, which is, the SE isn't everything, but you know, I, I had a conversation earlier today with with some people, and we were talking about uh, SE included in penetration tests. And I thought what was awesome was what what Kevin said was very similar to the argument that we were throwing out on on this call I was on earlier today. Where it, as as an attacker, if you're going to do an attack simulation, SE is a de facto component of that. And if you're going to do a penetration test and you're not going to have SE as a component of that, you're you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back. And, and, and you're not doing an accurate simulation of what a real-world attacker is going to do. Um, and if, if it, it's, it's somewhat gratifying to hear that, you know, here it is, Kevin Mitnick, you know, the guy with the reputation of being the, the, the social engineer dude and everything, if he's having issues, you know, getting people to – tie in SE into their pen test, you know, then you know you know where the rest of us are coming from as well. Yeah, and, and I think, especially, yeah, I agree with that statement, especially because it's him. I mean, you would think if anyone's going to hire a social engineer uh, to do a pen test, you're going to hire a guy who's made his, his name in the yep. world because of that. Yeah, I, I, but, but I agree with the whole philosophy. I mean, that conversation to me was really good because, uh, you know, I don't, of course, we all know this, we don't promote, we don't condone what Anonymous and Lulsec and these hacktivist groups have done illegally. But you think about maybe the effect. I mean, when that guy comes out on, on public and says, you know, SE is used in every attack that we've done, you know, every attack has had some form of SE in it, uh, that, that's got to open up corporations' eyes. They have to start realizing that, sure, maybe we were pretty well protected. You know, maybe we had um, some good some good policies in place and good passwords and this and that, and there was some vulnerability deep in the system. And it couldn't have got found by scanning and, and um, you know, looking at the servers for too long and using different tools. But the vulnerability was, uh, was, was released because of a question that was asked or an email that was sent or a, a phishing e- email that was sent in. I mean, the, just to look at that and say, now, no, you're not allowed to use social engineering in your pen tests. Uh, mm-hmm. It just seems so backwards, you know, so backwards. Mm-hmm. So you, you throw a scan on a server and you say, nope, you're 100% secure, great. But one phone call later, and now we have access, uh, it just seems to me like that should be something, even if they don't want the full bore, you know, we're going to break in and steal your servers, red teaming kind of testing, um, at least including some level of phishing, uh, spear phishing phone calls into yeah. your penetration testing. To me, to me, should be a standard in in the industry. Well, I, I think one of the things that, that I run into when I'm doing a penetration test anymore is, you know, it, we all have various automation tools, whether they be vulnerability scanners, uh, Core Impact, uh, Metasploit, uh, Professional, or Express, those sorts of things. Great tools. You know, you, you set them up, you click run, you click go. Um, obviously, we hope that not everyone is doing just that as their penetration test, but but you know that, that that's going to be a component of, of a lot of this stuff. From my perspective, there is absolutely no excuse in this day and age, and with the the how widespread automatic updates are, how everybody knows that they should have good change control procedures, they should have good uh, good patching policies. There's absolutely no excuse for one of those automated tools to to pop a shell somewhere. That that that's 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 the lowest hanging fruit. And if you're doing a penetration test and you're going to limit the scope to be as such where that's really all you have is known vulnerabilities that, that are out there, then how is that in any way possible an accurate reflection of what your exposure really is? That, that's, I think, that's just completely I think, ridiculous. I think Kevin hit the nail on the head when he said most companies just want a compliance check mark. Yeah. That's it. You know, that's what they're well, looking for. They're looking for the little box that says everything's good. And that's it. That, that's to be honest. When 
I, I think we've already hit the stage in the industry where a lot of companies don't have security departments anymore. They have compliance departments. And yeah. th- there's a big difference between what the goal is when you're focused on compliance versus being focused on security. And one of the, the biggest things I started getting worried about when all of the LulzSec and anonymous hacks and everything first started happening and it started getting all that main, mainstream uh, attention was the first thing that a lot of politicians started talking about was passing laws to implement new federal compliance standards on organizations as if that's really going to help. As if that's really going to make make uh, prevent this from occurring again. Yeah, I mean, you look know, at the you know the way it is now. I mean, they have the uh, GLBA, they have all these uh, laws in, in place that are supposed to make things more secure. HIPAA, and and you'll still see um, hospitals transmitting data from one building to another over a, a, a web network because all it requires is security, and web is security, right? <laughs> So yeah. it's un- the unbelievable uh, the, the 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 regulations, if they're going to be made, definitely need to be done at a different level. Well, e- even look at PCI. You know, PCI is supposed to be the non-governmental, the flexible standard that changes on a rapid basis. You know, the, the standard is always updating. How long did they keep WEP in there? You know, how how long was new WEP deployments allowed? You know, well after the point where everybody knew how to crack web, you know, is a child's right. play to crack web. Right. You know, my, my nine-year-old could crack web. You know, right. it, 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 it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's not a joke. I mean, it, but they, they kept it in the standards as saying, okay, for new, new deployments for so long. You know, it's, it winds up becoming just another way of pointing the finger and assigning blame to things and not really a, a, a issue of improving security. And so, so what do you do? Soapbox, I guess. We talk Soapbox about it. Us, but, yeah, we talk about it on our podcast. We, do. we talk about it on our podcast, and we hope that some senators listening to this podcast and calls us and says, make the new laws, guys. There you go. There you go. I don't know. So, but it's def- definitely an interesting interview and, and very interesting that, that here you go with, you know, uh, to, for lack of a better term, the, the celebrity um, I- individual having the exact same uh, obstacles as everybody yeah. else. There was a good question because I really wanted to hear if his obstacles to getting SE pen tests were were different than, than ours. Yeah, I mean, like for him, I could totally see a legitimate idea of someone saying, we want SE in a pen test but not from you because we think that you're a different caliber, um, you know, right or wrong. You know, I could see this as being a company's perspective. We think you're a different caliber of, of, of attacker than what we would have come after us. So we want SE included but not not to the level that you would do. I, I, could, I could see that as being an opposition. If that was his answer, or I, what I was almost expecting, too, is that more people would want SE pen test because he's yeah. Kevin Mitnick. Yep. You know, like, yep. if you think about social engineering, you think about Kevin. So if your company is saying, well, who can we hire to do an SE pen test that we know is not going to, you know, not going to screw us over completely and they'll release this information, well, you've got a famous social engineer that, that, you know, got arrested for this and now is on the good side. It seems like that mm-hmm. would be the guy, you know, that you want to have do the pen test. But, yeah, I don't know. It, it was interesting, though, like you said, to hear his his take on it. Really, really no, cool. It. I mean, the book in general, you know, just talk about a, a second about that. You know, I I have that review copy, but I, I got to admit, I went out and I bought the Kindle copy simply because I wanted an e-book because I have I have an easier time reading without having a haul. Back then. Well, too bad. Um, you know, what can you, <laughs> come and get it. Come and get it. Um, <laughs> I want my book. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, wound, I wound up, I, I started reading it as like, you know, this is actually a pretty decent book. I, I, I wanted to have it on my Kindle, so I, I bought it. I, I read it. It went. It reads pretty quick, um, but not too quick. It's it's definitely an entertaining read. If you're in the industry, it's um, you, you'll find something of relevance. And if you're depending on the age, you know, I, I thought that was the other interesting thing about about it was, you know, I'm, I'm not as old as Kevin, but um, I, I was aware of my surroundings at the times that he was doing a lot of this this sort of work, and I remember, you know, when he throws me years, I, I couldn't help but think back to where was I at in my life at that time. You know, I remember being in high school and calling into BBSs. You know, the, the internet wasn't necessarily widespread, and you know, here you are using FidoNet and everything else to to send out emails and. You know, I, I remember those times, and so from a nostalgia, you know, sort of uh, standpoint, it, it's kind of interesting to 
to read it with that that point of view of what was I doing when he was doing this. Yeah, the thing is, I think I'm like the same age or or with a year or two of Kevin. So when I was reading it, I had the same thoughts, but I'm like, yep, I remember that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, us old timers, huh? There you go. There you go. Man. Well, and I, I think too, you know, speaking of, of old, old times, I think that the the standpoint of of uh, he, uh, when, when you read the book, you you, you come across a, a section where he says, and it's it's just thrown out there so extremely casually. The first thing I would do when moving to a new town is compromise the phone system. Right. And it, it, like, yeah, no big deal, you know. I mean, like the right. first thing I do when I move into a new town is, you know, I make sure my mail forwarding is set up right. Right. You know, I, I, I check out where the pizza place is. You know. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's like oh, he this checklist of things to do. You know, subscribe to the local paper. So, you know, right. compromise the phone system. You right. know, get get a get a Discount club a card at the at the local you know shopping mall. Yeah. <laughs> Checklist, you know. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Got the movie rentals. Uh, got the post forwarded. Uh, got my newspaper. Compromised phone system. <laughs> And, and it's really difficult to to figure you know to really get the sense of how much time some of this this took him. But you really get the sense that some of these times it was you know three four calls and he's got full access to the to this phone system. So he can dial I'm into the sure three route case. calls. Blah blah blah. You know, and and it makes you wonder. You, know, I mean, any of us that have done work with telcos before, we know how slow they work. You know, we we know they don't move very quick. Uh, you know, how much of that infrastructure is still deployed out that exact same way? And we we talk about you know, there, there's there's stories that wind up in, in the press that are really big and uh, a little bit inflammatory. Get a lot of attention about you know China's uh, invading the United States power system and telephone system, and they can take down critical infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if all it takes is one. Dude, you know, a little schmuck in the middle of nowhere to make three phone calls, and then they have full access to the telephone system. Come on, you know, is, are we really worried about you know a nation state as being our, our biggest fear? Is, is, right. is that really what we? Is that the boogeyman here? <laughs> well, let's let's not give any ideas out, huh? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's hey, it's it's not our book, you know. This, this is all out of us. So we'll, we'll just we'll just point that liability somewhere else. So I, I have this interview with uh, thestreet.com, right? Um, I went in for that TV thing that was, that's mm-hmm. online now. Is, and, is that uh, the one where you're on the cover with a dog and you've no, you got no socks on? God, God, no, anyhow. So okay. that's the one when I went in with Andy Greenberg and I had the little TV interview and then I had this uh, this guy that's a reporter for The Street came out and asked me some questions. He's from the U.K. So he calls me the other day and he says, hey, can we talk about this guy who did hacking of the insulin machines? And I huh? said, well, I don't know a lot about it. You know, I read the articles and I read his work from Black Hat because uh, I, I have some friends that actually use those insulin pumps, so it it, it was interesting to me. Um, and this all ties into what you just said uh, somehow in my weird mind. So <laughs> um, we're talking, and he's like, you know, do you really think, he asked me this question, do you really think it's as bad as 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 it is, or should we just blow it off? And, you know, I, now I'm talking with this guy. I'm in a conversation, and I say, well, you know, imagine this, uh, you know, the president of the U.S. or a senator or, or some high-profile person has diabetes and uses one of these pumps, and it becomes public knowledge. Now you want to assassinate him. You don't have to, you don't have to like, send a sniper. All you have to do is send a guy with a big antenna, one-mile radius. Uh, Jason, uh, the guy said that he had, um, uh, he was able to control it from one mile away. And, and you have a big antenna, you just stand out when he's giving one of his outdoor speeches and, shoot him up with a couple yeah. thousand cc's of insulin and he's dead yeah. you know and and as i'm saying this and he's typing like a hundred miles an hour you're like I'm oh saying, crap <laughs> i'm saying holy crap dude i just said like assassinate the president you know like on and a now phone. you just said it on a podcast you idiot come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay well i'm having a dang <laughs> anyhow i'm like <laughs> Okay. Let's just make a note that that's Chris that has mentioned that, not Jim. Yeah, my name is James O'Gorman. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so anyhow, I asked him to sh- strike that, and he did change it in the article. So it was just hope, high-profile person, not yeah, you know, yeah. You know not what I just said on the about podcast those, <laughs> about those um, insulin pumps? Is years back, I, I had a friend that had one of those, and he uh, he used to win a ton of eating contests with that thing because he, he would right before the, the eating contest would start, he would, he would adjust the settings and he would be just a bottomless pit afterwards. And what? so he would get into like wing eating contest. Like cheating. 
Oh God! I, I just imagine what it's doing to his body, you know. But but he would win these these food eating contests like crazy because of his diabetes and manipulating that machine. That was his. Uh, that is that ridiculous. Was, um, uh, yep. That's yep. ridiculous. It has nothing to do with hacking. It's just what, one of those those little things that that stuck with me, you know, over the years. One of those gym stories that we always hear. Yep. Yep. Well, um, what else do we got? This was a long podcast. It was, it was, but it was, it was, it was good. You know, we had a, had a good conversation. You know, we, we've been doing this for years. And so it's about years, uh, over a year <laughs> we've been doing it. No, we're, we're at what? 20 no, something now? Dude, we're at 26. We've been, we're, this yeah. is over two years yeah. old. We can use the term years now. And this is the first time that we, we actually brought a uh, Mitnick on. So, you know, something that we probably should have done sometime before, but you know, good, to, good to finally do it. You know, real good reason to do it now with the, with his new book out. So, so, uh, we got all that. I'm going to put that in the show notes with his book link. Um, yep. you know, I want to also mention if you like the intro and outro music, you can check out dual core, dual core uh, you could follow us. We are IRC at uh, channel social-engineer on the Freenode network. Uh, you can check us out on Twitter. We're Human Hacker. Of course, we got our sites, uh, social-engineer.org, and our new site, social-engineer.com, where we're promoting our class coming up and uh, social engineering pen testing, auditing other services like that. Uh, I guess that's about it. So maybe just say goodbye now until next month, and we'll see you online. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna use every trick in the book. I'm gonna try my best to get you hooked. I'm gonna use every trick in the book. I'm gonna try my best to get you, get you. It's the SE derivative. That's me, I'm prime. The last thing I want is suspicion of a crime. My positive demeanor and my smile make it fine. With eye contact for the right amount of time. Too much and not enough doesn't seem for real. Got a nice firm handshake sealing the deal. Know a little about a lot and a lot about a little. So most conversations put me somewhere in the middle. My pop culture knowledge would be feeling kind of scary. It lets me chat with working class and gossip secretaries. Recon the boardroom, looking for the top thing. Loosen up execs when I ask about the golf swing. Start spewing secrets, just like a torrent. Can't really blame them, we all want to feel important. It might seem different from what you were envisioning. The key to communicate is all about the listening. Every trick in the book, I'm gonna try my best to get you hooked. I'm gonna use every trick in the book, I'm gonna try my best to get you, get you. I'm gonna use every trick in the book, I'm gonna try my best to get you hooked. I'm gonna use every trick in the book, I'm gonna try my best to get you, get you. Offering support to employees is the best when I'm calling random users and claiming I'm a tech. He's just here to help. So the reason I believe in him, jamming, planning, scamming, spanning every single medium. Recording while I'm spidering your phone menu system. The mirror written, use it for my own acquisition. Get him on the line, I just do a little switching. Sending out my number in the message when I'm fishing. Six billion people, it's really quite a market. Customers, employees, everyone's a target. Backing up my claims, using all the common slang. Lingo for the layout, drop the manager's name. Collecting all the sweet stuff like honey to a bumblebee. Like every unlisted number dialed to your company. You saw me, you probably think I'm clumsy, but I'm not. Cause I'm dropping all these USB drives around the parking lot. Oh, uh, what? I'm gonna use every trick in the book. I'll try my best to get you hooked. I'm gonna use every trick in the book. I'll try my best to get you, get you. I'm gonna use every trick in the book. I'll try.